long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a Doof Media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series. My name is Constant Reader Scott Daly, aka the Little Podcaster, and shh, shh, I'm the one that Big Podcaster forgot about. You, you have to be quiet, or you'll wake him. And oh, oh no, oh no, he's awake. My name is Matt the Brat, and you have disturbed my sleep. Oh God. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Ask your question or be destroyed. Matt, how's it going this week? This question is adequate. I am well. Is that is that how the audiobook person does Blaine? You know, they don't they don't do a particularly weird voice for Blaine. Like it's not a it it, it doesn't come across that it would be written in all caps. In fact, huh. I had to actually I actually only, only noticed that when I was pulling quotes um so that's so fascinating to me it's not a shout it's not even a particularly robotic voice Um, yeah i mean i I knew i I knew it was human sounding but i always assumed a little bit more shouty because hence the all caps that's fascinating i I think the fact is just that shouting doesn't actually work in an an audio drama context yeah you're right um but i mean it works really well for me i was (laughs) i was just kind of doing a voice (laughs) yeah i mean I guess like we haven't even started introducing the show, but now we've gone down this rabbit hole and I'm just going there. But I guess like it's not so much that he's shouting, just that it's being played at a very loud volume. Yeah. Which makes I, sense. And I think he's he's sort of aggro and on edge, too. But yeah, yeah that's I true. Think you're right. <laughs> that's true. Anyway, this week on the show, we are concluding our dive into the Wastelands Chapter 5 Bridge and City with uh, sub sections 23 through 40. So. Yeah, the end of the chapter. We're finishing chapter five of The Wastelands. Jake meets the TikTok man far underneath the city of Lud, and all looks lost until Roland and Oi arrive to rescue him. Meanwhile, Susanna and Eddie deal with the insane ghost in the machine of Lud named Blaine, who just wants to answer some neat riddles while also releasing a, a poisonous gas that will destroy every living person in the city. Matt, what did you think about this week's reading? There's just so much in here, right? Like, yeah, I, I yeah. Think it's definitely a good call to split this chapter up into two discussions because just this, this latter half of the chapter, I was like, man, I don't even remember everything that happens in here, <laughs> and I just read it. Like, it's so, it's so interesting and and complicated and full of ideas and stuff that happens. Yeah, like there's so much stuff in it where I'm like, just like full of questions now. Um, really yeah. eager to to read on. I I think arguably I should have split it up. I should have done a little bit more content in last week's to leave the end for this week's discussion. Because the yeah the, the the back half of this chapter is stuffed. Yeah, um, absolutely stuffed. There's a whole lot going on here. So I agree with that for sure. Can't wait to get into it because it's just I I don't know. It's it was it, it was really for for some reason this week the script was more fun to to go through than usual. Interesting. Yeah. I mean I think one of the things that's cool to me is that the question that I've always been asking myself is like, what is this book about? And I don't mean like the literal plot. I mean, like thematically, what is this book trying to say? What is this book trying to explore? And I think it's not really until we get into Lud that the idea of the wastelands really starts to, to appear. Um, and the theme of this, uh, this, this ruined wasteland of humanity, um, really starts to present itself. And, and that links up a lot with the T.S. Eliot poem that uh, King based the title of this book off of. So, it's a, it's a lot of fun. I, I I totally agree with you that this is a really fun chapter and and it's a one I've enjoyed the book. We've only got a little bit more after this week and then we get to circle around and talk about the book as a whole and I'm incredibly excited for that discussion. So Yes, me too. First things first though, let's finish up chapter 5. So we pick up right where we left off, but this time we're in Roland's head. He he didn't die, Matt. You you absolute dummy. I I can't believe <laughs> I can't believe you thought Roland died. What an idiot, Matt. Even Roland kind of thinks you're an idiot as he points out how fucking obvious the trap is. He says the dangling fountain was absurd, a trap which might have been set by a stupid child. <laughs> I, I don't remember saying that he that he died, but I mean, you I guess, hint you hinted. I guess I must have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, listeners, please go back and check. I <laughs> can't recall. Um, I was really hoping you would. That's I, that's I'm just working. I, I want you to be wrong about some things. You were you were incredibly right about Blaine this week. So I just I was looking for something for you to be wrong. about. Oh, I'm sure that will happen on its own. Scott, <laughs> we just keep doing this and you keep urging me to make predictions. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is extremely funny that King almost is like making fun of us for being worried at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Like, of course, Roland won't fall for that. Like, th- these guys have no idea who they're dealing with. Mm-hmm. It, it reminds me a lot of the time when Roland was possessing Mort in the pharmacy, and um, and it was just clear that mortal men without supernatural help should just never attempt to stand against Roland. Um, and, you know, it, it reminded me of I think a conversation we had around that point where where we talked about I think a similar thing. Like, normally I'm I, I get annoyed easily by excessively badass protagonists, but by protagonists who can just do everything, mm. who are who are too cool and, and too deadly. Uh, you know, we we talked about that some with Sanderson's books recently, um, and I'm just not entirely sure why Roland works so well for me. Why he seems to be exempt from that like category of annoyance for me. What do you think it is about him? I think it's because Roland is always kind of playing from behind. Like, he, yes, he's badass and cool and awesome and and simple, stupid tricks will never defeat him. But like he he's always has a disadvantage in, in every conflict we've seen him in. He's at the disadvantage, really. Like in Tull, he's surrounded like a whole town's worth of people are attacking him in under the the mountain. He's got um, hundreds of muties. We don't even see how many there are. Um even even on our world, he's at a disadvantage because he doesn't understand how things work. So he's kind of playing from behind there. I just think in every instance, there's oh, he's always outnumbered. Um, not he's smarter than the people, but like sometimes just brute force can take down intelligence. Um, so it never feels to me like he's just waltzing through each conflict, not actually in danger. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, and he is always having to improvise. Like yeah, he, he's yeah. never really sure how he's going to get out of this particular scrape. Yeah, um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I think one thing I was thinking about is the fact that he is occasionally made like the butt of a joke. Like sure, sure. Yeah, like the especially the fish out of water stuff, and like just kind of puncturing the balloon l- a little bit, letting a little bit of that air out, and being like, ah, you know, he's really good at this over here, but like he doesn't. He, he's, he can be silly sometimes. He can make yeah. mistakes that that humanizes him a bit for me, I think. Yeah, he's also occasionally an incredibly cool hard ass that uh, will willfully abandon the people he loves for the right. concept of his quest. Like the idea. Yes, he's a he's a maybe overpowered badass, but he's not like a paragon of all that is good and wonderful in the world. Right. Like right. He, he represents that to some people. But it's like it's like the myth and the man kind of coming into conflict with each other. Yeah, I like that. So, yeah, cool. Good. Good talk. Yeah. (laughs) Good talk. We should just finish every episode of the podcast like that. Yeah. Good talk. All right. Uh, So Oi is going to be a pretty big part of this last last half of the chapter here, Matt. His relationship with Roland specifically will be highlighted, which I think is kind of really important here because Roland has a pretty unique and personal relationship with each member of his quartet, with Eddie, with Susanna and with Jake. But Oi is this maybe member that stands kind of unique from that. Like his connection to the group is through Jake and nothing more. Um, but we start off this week with Roland picking up Oi, and we get this wonderful moment at first Oi stiffened and attempted to pull away. And then Roland felt the small animal give in. He wasn't happy about being this close to someone who wasn't Jake, but he clearly intended to put up with it. Roland found himself wondering again, just how intelligent Oi was. And that is a answer that we'll definitely get yeah. this week. Yeah, um, I, I like this bit right here. I, I, even, I especially like this quote you pulled. I mean, I feel like Oi is a really interesting opportunity to study how characterization works in in the abstract, because mm-hmm. Oi is a character. He's a character, but he can't really talk. He can sort of talk, but not really. Mm-hmm. So, so King doesn't have access to a lot of the common tools of characterization, like like his voice. I mean. He, he has it's, it's sort of one dimensional. He re- repeats things. He occasionally says single words. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically, I think that we're seeing here like a, a really fantastic example of how details allow a character to take root in, in our mind. Because here, Oi reminds me of like dogs and cats that I've known and, and you know may, maybe owned and or, or maybe just interacted with, especially at those specific moments when those animals like impress you by like making a sophisticated judgment or like showing an ability to to figure something out or to to delay gratification and and like that's sort of the the thing the the sort of thing you're seeing in oi here and immediately like connects connects this experience with this creature into your own experience um and i think this is showing don't telling right this is king is is not just telling us how smart oi is he's showing us in a bunch of these really small ways almost indistinguishable ways 
uh, that he's smart, particularly these ways that we can relate to easily. Yeah, I like that. I, I like that a lot. You're, I think you're absolutely right there. Um, and and I think it's important that this interaction is happening with Roland himself, that that they are the bond between them is forming here because yeah. like Oi, and it's it's through this that King shows Oi's intelligence because he doesn't like anyone but Jake. But here's Roland, and Roland is the key to Jake, and therefore he's going to work with him. And then we see, uh, like, uh, over the course of this chapter, both halves of it, we've kind of seen Roland go from thinking this bump, Billy Bumbler is just like maybe a slightly different animal to developing a real sense of respect for it. That like not only is it intelligent, um, it cares for jake it's valuable and stuff like that so roland does indeed set off the trap intentionally matt wondering if jake heard the noise and if so would assume that he was dead he wants gasher to think that but actually expects jake to be smarter than that i really love how king plays with dramatic irony here we saw last chapter that for a brief moment jake did indeed think that roland was dead when he heard that noise but as soon as we get back to a jake chapter or jake portion of the chapter here in a moment um his head has cleared a little bit he's calmed down a little bit and he recognizes exactly what Roland kind of just assumes here. A gunslinger would never fall for so obvious a trap. So Roland is talking about and pondering about Jake's reaction here. And we get to see that and see that Jake does not let him down, even though that's probably never like a conversation that they're going to have with uh, each other. Yeah. Yeah. I j- just to, you know, jump back to this idea that, that like, of course, Roland's not going to fall, fall for that. I love how he's like, of course, Roland was aware of everything in his field of view, including things that were, above him at all times <laughs> right which right. is which is so funny because like when you're especially when you're like if you were chasing somebody through this warren of of tangled like wires and pipes and garbage and you're, you're trying to follow a trail your eyes are going to be on the ground right but like no sure not, sure not, not rolling <laughs> yeah especially after you almost bumped into two crossed wires a, yeah. a little bit ago you're going to be paying special close attention for that kind of stuff right, right. um yeah, and and I think actually that goes back to what you were talking about, about why Roland the badass character isn't as off-putting. Like, he almost died, right? Like, yeah. he literally totally almost missed the wire trap. It, he literally says, if not for Ka, I would have run into those wires and, and I'd be dead now. So, like, I think that is part of why, like he's not so overly powerful and overly badass that he's just becomes uninteresting. It's like, yes, this particular trap, he gunslingered the shit out of it, but the past one, the earlier one actually would have totally gotten him if not for destiny stepping in yep. and, and making him notice it. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. So Roland and Oi arrive at the sewer grate and Roland scoops up Oi, leashes him and stuffs him in his shirt. <laughs> So, Matt, I have a puppy that my wife and I got back in November. So she's about eight months old now, and she's probably about Oi's size, and she loves us both, and she trusts me very much. But if I tried to pick that dog up and stick it in my shirt, <laughs> she would freak the fuck out and, like, slice the shit out of my belly with her claws. Uh-huh. So I think, once again, to go back to what you were talking about, the show don't tell, Oi is smart here. He's smart enough to realize he's not just an an animal, even an animal of, of above average intelligence to rec- to recognize that there is necessity here that you can go beyond your base instinct, which is even if it's a person I trust. Oh, my God, I'm in some confined, weird space. I don't like this. I'm going to freak out. Uh, Oi doesn't do that. Yeah, I like I like that you pointed this out because I think that my first thought upon considering this was like, yes, yes, Oi is very trusting. And and then upon consideration, I was like, no, he's not trusting, actually. He's actually skittish and paranoid, and, and he, he's he's a wild animal. Um, he I think he may be trusting of Jake, but he's definitely not trusting in the abstract. I uh, I think like you like you said there, he's just done the calculation figured out that the only way down into the manhole is under Roland's shirt. And so he tolerates it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I, 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 you're, you're totally right. And that's why I think we see Oi as, as you said, a character, yeah. not just, not just an animal companion. He is a character. Yeah. He's, he's got agency. He's, he can mm-hmm. figure things out. Yeah. He's got wants and needs. And like you said, because he cannot speak, Normally, King has to represent those wants and needs through action rather than dialogue. Yeah. And I think he does a very good job of that. Yeah. 
As the two head into the sewers to search for Jake, we cut back over to Eddie and Susanna just entering the Cradle of Lud. As they get closer to the building, they notice that ab- above the totems of the beam and some scary looking dragon gargoyle things is, quote, a golden warrior at least 60 feet high. A battered cowboy hat was shoved back to reveal his lined and careworn brow. A bandana hung askew on his upper chest as if it had just been pulled down after serving long, hard duty as a dust muffle. In one upraised fist, he held a revolver. In the other, what appeared to be an olive branch. Roland of Gilead stood atop the cradle of blood, dressed in gold. No, she thought, at last remembering to breathe again. It's not him. But in another way, it is. That man was a gunslinger, and the resemblance between him, who's probably been dead a thousand years or more, and Roland is all the truth of Katet you'll ever need to know. So the entire second half of this book has been devoted to the mythology of gunslingers, basically. And I think this is the moment where that idea becomes the most textual here. We're sitting in this holy place in the middle of the city. It's it's where the it's across the beam. All the beam guardians are adorned on top of the building. And above them all, above all that is the gunslinger, the most revered, the golden gunslinger, even Back in the olden days, the thousands of years ago, in the original days of lead, gunslingers were these revered people. Yeah, right. Like some kind of warrior priest thing, you know. It, it's yeah, really, yeah. really interesting. It's I'm I'm really surprised to see this here. Actually, this is not what I would have expected. Mm-hmm. Um, so a, a few a few things about this spectacle, though. Like the olive branch is, of course, a symbol with the perfectly clear meaning to us. It's a symbol of peace. Mm-hmm. The, the American eagle is you know that the crest the, the american eagle crest uh, that's on like the quarter and so forth it's holding arrows in one claw and an olive branch in the other um which is the same thing right he's holding a yeah. pistol in one hand and an olive branch in the other it's it's basically the gunslinger in, in in the abstract the concept of gunslinger is like the bald eagle of midworld it's the symbol of truth um it's yeah yeah, yeah symbol of truth justice justice in the mid midworld again way um <laughs> and and uh like uh, it's just it's so it's so interesting and strange it struck me as odd though because it's just odd for a gunslinger to be portrayed this way Mm -hmm. because it seems kind of decadent like i don't think roland or for that matter court would ever choose to be portrayed as a giant gold statue in in this grandiose way uh it's very like lud to 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 take to take something and, and gild it right Yeah. 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 And when I first read this, my initial thought was like, oh, Matt and his time travel theory are going to have a heyday with this. But I do think like King tries to make it as textually clear here as possible that this person is this is not supposed to be a statue of Roland. It looks like Roland from a glance, but it is not supposed to be Roland. It is a gunslinger in much the same look as Roland looks, which is an interesting idea on its own. Right. Because like this is supposed to be the the time before the world ended right where the 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 great old ones and the the epitome of civilization and power um and like when first reading through these books i think you get this idea of gunslingers as these people that were created out of the hardships of the dark ages of the world let's say Right. That that like this warrior code came about in response to the tough life that everyone was living and they became an important figure in that life because how else do you keep civilization going unless you have some sort of knight type figure like a gunslinger that is going to to hold truth justice in the midworld the kin way. But this statue predates that theoretically this is supposed to be like before the fall of lead before the fall of the great old ones so gunslingers this idea was around even before that it predates even that yeah exactly i i like that a lot like it, it would be as if we had like giant statues of like fbi agents or something yeah it's, yeah. it's hard to even reach for the parallel like, like maybe an infantry soldier like i guess we do honor our soldiers but we don't treat them this way certainly um right and like and like you would think an ancient civilization's version of a gunslinger even if they still had the concept of the the gun-toting knight wouldn't they dress a little bit differently like wouldn't they like if we were honoring the american soldier as a symbol of america right that our ancient building would would not have him in 
a cowboy hat. Yeah. <laughs> they would have him in colonial clothing. In right. fact, we have statues like that all over the place. Yeah. And, and he has not only that, but he has, he has a pistol. He has the, the six shooter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's not even a, it's not even a high tech, you know, laser gun or whatever. Like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like you might expect. I mean, I, I, admittedly, Ludd doesn't look like a laser gun type of place necessarily. It's hard to tell what kind of technology they have and don't have. Um, but but I would expect them to have something more advanced than a six shooter since they have like bombs. and. Yeah, I mean, the the prevailing theory right now is that they nuked themselves to death. Um, yeah. That hasn't been confirmed or not, but that's what our characters think. Right. Yeah, you would think a, a, a civilization with the ability to do that um, and build AI trains <laughs> would would um, have their soldiers equipped with a little bit more. But I mean, you're right. It's symbolic. It's just like our our we put arrows in the eagle not a gun <laughs> because because it's a symbol just like the gun here is a symbol of something I mean, but yeah. it is interesting kind of squaring the symbol in the ancient past versus what we have now yeah. i think it kind of shows midworld as this place of like just st- like staticness right uh-huh. that like like here's an image of a man from a thousand years ago and he still looks exactly like a man looks like right now or so then this just occurred to me, but it could be that like this is their image of of a gunslinger from their past, like a thousand years sure, before sure. this. Like, you know, we, we 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 don't put statues of of people in, in fatigues with with uh, M16s very often. So I, I think there's probably a few of them, but not often. But we do like build new statues of, you know, people on horses with cutlasses and, and whatever. Um, sure. So like maybe maybe there were there were gunslingers like Roland and then and then there was a more modern age and now and now his his whole culture is more like a a throwback to that same thing i don't know i, I i'm not confident in all at all in that but um it it makes a, a degree of sense i think yeah yeah and i'm just having fun asking questions to which i already know the answer <laughs> um cuz that's what being in this role is all about matt you should have told me about this this is oh, so fun it it is it is i mean there there is the <laughs> fact that you have to like measure every single word that comes out of your mouth but yeah yes. there's definitely that to it too yeah yeah anyway anyway um so as maud and jeeves walk away susanna sees them for what they are monsters perhaps but also more Hansel and Gretel, less Bonnie and Clyde. She describes them as tired, frightened, confused, and lost so long in the woods that they had grown old there. I, I really love this, this Matt. I, I love that line, lost so long in the woods they, they've grown old there. We're, we're complicating these people that at first we saw as abject monsters. They're just scared children, basically, only they happen to be old. And they legitimately don't understand anything they've been tricked and driven mad by both the greys and by blaine um and the the scary ghosts that live under the city and i i think this is such a wonderful thing to do because it paints the fact that our heroes basically end up indirectly causing all of these people's deaths in a little bit more complex of a color yeah certainly um I, i'm not entirely sure what the book is saying with this yet um we may have to finish the book before I really understand what what we're saying thematically, but I'll take a stab at it here, though, because sure. this is as good a place as any. We've talked a bit before about the idea of victimhood and agency, and I've mentioned that, that I think personally that like the thing that distinguishes a gunslinger is that gunslingers aren't people that things happen to. They are fighters. They go after what they want. Anything that doesn't kill them is going to make them stronger. Um so here we've introduced this whole city of people who have been caught up in in the slow lingering death of the world where like take any one of them individually and you almost can't imagine how they would have done anything differently. They're, they're just trapped. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you certainly like it's like how how would anyone how would a gunslinger if you're treating it as an archetype, how would a gunslinger even arise in this situation? Like they would just become a monster, even even if a strong person arose here, that that would just become like a terrible warlord, right? Sure, so, sure. So, I mean, so, I think I think you could argue that that is Andrew Quick. Yeah, um, I, I think you're right. I think you're exactly right. But and, and, that, and that's so I don't know what what we're saying other than like yeah, I guess I guess people have to be given a hand up at some point um, to to sort of realize the the better better aspect of their nature. Um, one thing that that occurred to me though was, yeah, you point out that uh, um, you know Susanna notices that um, they're more like Hansel and Gretel, 
And I thought that was really interesting because after I thought about it for a minute, I realized Hansel and Gretel are gunslingers Um, (laughs) because they are like proactive. You know, they they try to leave themselves a breadcrumb trail. It just doesn't happen to work. Uh, They killed the fuck out of that witch. They cooked (laughs) her and they stole her stuff. I mean, they're gangster. Um, Yeah, that's true. But I mean, I, I, I get I get the I get the way Susanna intends it as a reference. But I also do wonder if King isn't being just like slightly clever here in, in, in yeah. a certain way. I don't know. I never thought about it that way, but I like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to me, the the entire point of this idea is the childish nature of them. Like, right. These are the pubes, right? These this is the group that is supposed to be the children. Yeah. And it turns out, actually, I think the greatest irony of this whole thing is that from what we see of the greys, they appear to be younger <laughs> than yeah. the pubes generally, that the greys are young now and the pubes are the old ones. Right. Um, but they are old in external appearance. Um, they are internally children. Yeah. They are just scared, confused children that don't know any better. Yeah. Um, like that's uh, that I, I just can't get over that line. Tired, frightened, confused and lost so long in the woods that they had grown old there. It's just so it's beautiful. Um, it's just a beautiful way to ex- express this idea of these people who just just a few paragraphs ago, we were like horrified by their monstrousness. And, and not that we're like giving them an excuse for murdering three people a day because of the drums that they hear. But still, I mean, like these are not. These are like the greys seem infinitely more monstrous, but even them, as we'll get to, like just seem like completely at the whim of of a tyrant. So, yeah, right. I mean, I, I think I think that we can view them with pity and even empathy without forgiving them for s- sinking to, to the level of monstrosity. Sure. Um, sure. Didn't we like this is a, this goes this goes well with the with the uh, Lord of the Flies reference, right? Yeah, from, yeah, you're right. From, you're right. From s- several weeks and half a book ago, because um, this is this is really very much that, right? It, it's a society where they've, you know, they're the children, right? They're they're the lost children of a society who have fallen to barbarism, and even slaughtering each other um, out of their fear and ignorance. And uh, yeah, that's exactly what this is. This is yeah. This is, and, yeah. and correct me if I'm wrong. It's been a while since I've read Lord of the Flies. It didn't didn't in lord of the Fri- flies the kids split into two factions anyway there were like two different groups of them based off of their like one of the group wanted to hunt and and violence and the other wanted to be slightly more at peace I and think so the, the yeah. group splintered into two factions that eventually started fighting each other i think that's what happens in lord of the flies so i think yes i think the pubes match up perfectly to lord of the flies but also just the fact that there's these two factions on in, within this place warring with each other i think fits lord of the flies very well as well yeah. Um now it makes me wonder if Catch twenty two matches up with the Greys in some clever way that I can't figure out because I haven't read Catch twenty two. I mean, one of them was in an airplane, a yeah. World War Two airplane, so there's that there's part. That, yeah. There's, <laughs> That's the literal interpretation. Yeah. It's about madness, which <laughs> True, true. Is also connected. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I don't know. It I I you know, I, I, and I, I don't think that's nothing, right? I think that is like a lot of the stuff that was happening in Jake's story was literally like Ka showing him these things that he was going to need later. Right. Here, right. Here's a book of riddles. Liter- literally exactly what you need. <laughs> You're going to need this exact object um, in, in a way more literal and direct way than than you might have expected as the reader or as Jake, certainly. Uh, and, and so, yeah, like, like the fact that those are the two books they read, I just can't help but read like that was priming him for this encounter with the pubes and the grays on some level. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Cool. Um, so a- as Maude and Jeeves leave them behind, Susanna and Eddie Dean have a moment. Uh, they're terrified. They're about to walk into a situation that might kill them both, but they are fiercely in love with each other. And Eddie turns to Susanna and says, you're the best thing that ever happened to me. His hazel eyes were totally focused on her. It's hard for me to say say stuff like that. Living with Henry made it hard, I guess, but it's true. I think I started loving you you because you were everything Roland took away from me. In New York, I mean. But it's a lot more than that now because I don't want to go back anymore. Do you? She looked at the cradle. She was terrified of what they might find in there, but all the same, she looked back at him. No, I don't want to go back. I want to spend the rest of my life going forward. As long as you're with me, that is. It's funny, you know, you saying you started loving me because of all those things he took away from you. 
Funny how. I started loving you because you set me free of Detta Walker. She paused, thought, then shook her head slightly. No, it goes further than that. I started loving you because you set me free of both those bitches. One was a foul-mouthed, cock-teasing thief, and the other was a self-righteous, pompous prig. Comes down to six of one half, half a dozen of another as far as I'm concerned. I like Susanna Dean better than either one, and you were the one who set me free. I really love this, Matt, and that's why I wanted to read that whole thing. I think so far in this book and the series as a whole, King has just kind of treated the relationship between Eddie and Susanna as just like a constant. It's a thing that happened back in the other book, and now it just continues to happen. It hasn't gotten a lot of focus. We haven't like really touched, like went and talked to each one of these characters and figure out how they feel about each other, how they feel about the relationship. Like we knew that it was still ongoing. King made that clear, like kind of externally and, and through little snippets, but we never really had either character to like talk about how they feel about the other one since that night on the beach where they looked up at the stars. Um, and, and so I think it's really fitting that near nearing the end of this book, we focus on it really quick here. Yeah. I, I love it. I love it being here. I mean, I like, I was also pretty sure it meant they were going to die immediately. <laughs> uh, I'm only half joking. Like, like this felt like a big old death flag, as, as the TV tropers would say. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, seeing how the rest of the scene plays out, uh, the rest of the chapter too, I think King is just taking this opportunity to flesh out their relationship, um, which is really very much needed at this point, I think, because mm-hmm. there, there has been this big blank, like, why are they really together? You know, right, right. It, it has been a question mark the whole time because we kind of knew why Odetta and Eddie liked each other, but that didn't really fully translate into, okay, but now Susanna is a different person. Why do these two people like each other? Um, and not just like each other, but clearly have this like incredible romance. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and how's that know. romance going? Like, how do they feel about each other now? Is it still going well? Like there hasn't been, we've spent a lot of time on the cotet as a unit. We have not spent a lot of time on this part of that relationship. Um, yeah. And I think it's important that we do so. It is. And it's just filled in so tenderly and beautifully here. And I really, mm-hmm. I really liked it. And um, I was happy yeah. to see it. I, I, I like you talking about the death flag, though, because this is one of those things that me as a multiple time reader, like I just don't even think about anymore. Uh-huh. Like it, it just like it's very possible that the first time I read the scene, I was right there with you where I was like, oh, yeah, one of them's one of both of them are going to die. Uh-huh. here. This is yeah. so obvious. But of course, I knew what happened. So I, I, I that didn't even occur to me. And this is why I, I think it's so fun to read it with someone who's who's never read it before, because those are things I just would never have thought about. Yeah. But you having that first time perspective get to like we get to see the emotions as you read it's really great sure it, that's one of the fun things about this particular role is i get to kind of record these thoughts so that mm-hmm. i can listen later potentially and be like yeah, yeah. that's i don't remember that that's weird yeah <laughs> great great so to set our scene as they walk into the cradle king has the first autumn storm of midworld arrive just as the two walk inside like the wind picks up and ra- it starts to rain it's really wonderful scene setting here um and before we leave the scene behind i kind of want to talk about that word cradle for a bit more with you matt since our last episode i i, I did some digging to make sure that like the word cradle has no specific connotation to train station at all. We talked about this last week and we said, I think it's true, but we weren't sure. So I did some digging. No cradle train station never meant that in our world ever, (laughs) ever. Uh So this is definitely totally something that King made up, something that was chosen for a specific reason. And we had a listener last week comment um, named Coach Wargo suggested that the Cradle of Lud was perhaps a play on words of the Cradle of Love, which is a Billy Idol song. And I wonder if there's something to that, Um, because we already talked about in this moment as they're walking into this place, we see Eddie and Susanna, the sudden outpouring of love that we haven't seen them kind of express to each other throughout the rest of this book. But also cradle is a place of origin, the cradle of civilization. It's not only a bed for a baby, but is a term that refers to the earliest period of life, right? Like from the cradle, Um, there is a certain irony that that it will be from this cradle that Blaine will exterminate all life in the city because this is, they're going to walk in here. They're going to activate Blaine and he is going to set timers to release a poisonous gas that will kill every single human being in the city. Um, and also we have to say it is, it is the place where Susanna potentially with child is about to enter. So there's, there's a lot going on here with this word cradle. Yeah. Uh, I think I found even more. I, I do like your, uh, cradle to the grave sort of, uh, thought process there. Mm-hmm. Um, 
there's there's one use of cradle that I'd never heard of actually until I looked it up, and apparently a cradle is a type of scythe. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, like the thing the Grim Reaper carries to kill. <laughs> so <laughs> wow. that's cradle. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, which of course, if you're if he's sending forth this cloud of death over the whole city, a scythe is a good uh, a good symbol there. Yes. Um, and then and then also another thing that made a, a bit of sense to me is like. You know how you'll see like a ship that's in dry dock sometimes, mm-hmm. sp- especially like in the olden days, and it'll be like held up by by timbers. The the structure of timbers that are holding the ship up is a cradle. Interesting. Um, and so you can sort of imagine like the the train being like in dry dock, sort of. Uh, obviously, that's not really true, but like it's. I I see that as being like the closest thing to a literal interpretation of why you would call this place a cradle. Um, I, I like all the other uh, re- readings we found for the like, why did King really choose this word? Um, <laughs> but but the but the li- in terms of a literal interpretation, it makes sense that it would just kind of be like, yeah, it's like it's a place where you hold a ship, sort of. Except it's a train instead of a ship. Yeah, yeah, and and we'll see here in in a, a few minutes that King does just like to make up words. Mm-hmm. Which uh-huh. I I as a person trying to look up the origin of these things find very frustrating at times because. Yeah. The origin is the man's brain. Yeah. Um, so we go back with Jake and Gasher. The orc has slowed his pace. He assumes Roland is dead and he's feeling quite good about it, which I think kind of is, is a wonderful thing we get to enjoy as readers because we're like, ha, Roland's plan worked. Ha ha ha. It's perfect. Um, then he starts to, to sing a, a rather disturbing song. Uh-huh. And then he forces Jake to sing a song of his own. And and I love this part where he says, there's haunts down here, boy. They live inside the fucking machines. So they do sing and keeps them off. Do you know that now sing? So I love this because we, we kind of built this understanding that the pubes were the children that were like terrified of the ghosts in the machine. And, and the grays were using that to trick them into killing themselves. But it's clear here that the greys also have this superstition as well. Uh Um, and their response to it is not quite as severe as the pubes, but they clearly have this fear. And I mean, it it turns out both sides, the fear is founded because the ghost in the machines is an AI, a a mad AI named Blaine that will kill everyone in the city because he's bored. Um, so they're not wrong, but I I just think it's, it's interesting that like, the more we spend with these two sides, the more similar they seem. Yeah. Um, it's funny cause well, like I don't necessarily read either side as being superstitious. Like I think they probably have either direct experience or like credible stories about like, yeah, like I, I saw one of these things or, or, mm-hmm. you know, it got my friend or something. And it, it, you know, even the idea that singing will, would kind of keep these things at bay sort of scans because, Blaine just wants entertainment fundamentally. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're willing to sing for them, then maybe they'll be like, yeah, okay, this is, this is fine. I won't kill you today. Yeah. It's kind of fun to play the game of where did, where did the, the myth of singing come from uh-huh. where it could have literally just been one of them bumped. Like Blaine was bored one day and was like, you entertain me. Right. And he started singing and lived and then he passed that on and it just spread throughout the graves <laughs> as this is the thing you do now. Uh, I love that. <laughs> I can it accepted. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I kind of love like the, both, both these characters sing here and I kind of love that both Gasher and Jake's song are about women. Gasher's is infinitely more crude than Jake's version, certainly, but they both basically, they both basically amount to the same thing. In essence, I buy something for my woman. I get her and her parts, whether it be her tits and Gasher's song or her hips and her eyes in Jake's. And I, I don't say this to say that King is like having us compare Jake to Gasher and be like, actually, he's just as bad as Gasher. Certainly not. But I do think that there's a lot that we might see in this ruined city of Lud that is supposed to be reminiscent of our world. Maybe there's this idea that the people we see here, these absolute monsters that that we see here, aren't as far removed from the people of our world that we know as we thought. Like, like how 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 hard would it be to take a person from New York city, put them through a life of fear, abuse and hardship and turn them into a person, person like Gasher. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I do think that that is one of the sort of themes that uh, of the story. I think that relates back to what we were talking about a minute ago. Um, with, um, the fact that the, the, like, like if, if you're, if you're just put in this, like 
hellhole for your entire life than what can really be expected of you. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I, so, so like speaking of your compare, you know, the idea that maybe we're comparing Jake and Gash, right? I, th- I, I thought kind of Jake's Jake chose this song in particular because he is actually reaching for something crude um, because he knows that that's less likely to get him hit, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. I but, think you're probably right there. Yeah. But, but also I, I do agree that like, like it's partially at least meant to make us realize that like these awful people aren't that distant from us because we have songs that are quite similar to their songs. Yeah. They're just not as crude, if you will. Yeah. I mean, Gasher's song was about buying a diamond engagement ring for a woman, right? Mm-hmm. Like, which is like, that's a, that's a earth thing. <laughs> that's right. like, a, not only is that an earth thing, that's a, 20th century earth thing like diamond engagement rings were not a thing throughout most of history that's a relatively recent tradition in in our world um so that immediately kind of puts you in the the earth mindset a little bit here yeah yeah that's uh, that's an interesting detail that you have pointed out (laughs) (laughs) all right so gasher leads jake jake further down into the undercity and finds Functional neon tubing, Matt. Ooh, uh-huh. fancy. Uh-huh. Uh, I love that Gasher says it's warm here in the winter, cool in the summer, with so much food that five hundred men could eat and couldn't eat in five hundred years. Um, it's basically as close to a paradise as you could possibly get in this world, uh-huh. and the pubes don't know anything about it, and it's ruled by a tyrant. And I think that is like that is kind of heartbreaking in a bit. Like you see like these pubes, which we've just called like Hansel and Gretel kids lost in the woods, scared, killing each other because they don't know anything better. And here underneath their feet is warmth, um, food, like uh, civilization basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, there's actually plenty of resources to take care of everyone, but they, they're still locked in this, in this endless fatal stalemate for basically yeah. no reason. It, it, yeah. it is sort of, a horrible like it's it's the definition of a senseless tragedy because it's yeah. just there's no need for this right yeah i mean one of the things that i enjoy most about this this chapter is this idea that king does not really take any time to like redefine the conflict for us like we we were told the history of this conflict we were told that the pubes were the people that held the city the grays were the the outlaws outside the city that were trying to get in because it's like the last bastion of civilization and they want in they want access to that stuff and that is the way the conflict went for hundreds maybe thousands of years until they finally got into the city everything broke down and there's not like none of neither side we meet is like I'm just going to get those pubes or I'm we're this is it. We're going to fight back against the grays and take control. It's like, these are people that are killing each other and hate each other and nobody remembers why anymore. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's great. Um, right. It's, I, I was almost going to compare it to the Hatfields and the McCoys, except I think they, <laughs> they at least had a narrative for why they were fighting. These, right. these are just that these people don't even seem to have an ideology or like a, uh, uh, a narrative yeah i it, mean they might but king doesn't show it to us because yeah. it doesn't matter yeah it's just yeah. those are the other guys yeah. yeah yeah and in case anyone didn't believe the gasher equals an orc paradigm that matt has been presenting to us for the the last couple of weeks king almost makes it just literally textual here matt uh, he says there were monsters under the city trolls and boggarts and orcs Hadn't he been captured by just such a one? <laughs> uh-huh. um, I, I think we've been talking about Lord of the Rings a lot. And obviously, I, I think there have been multiple moments throughout the story that has just aligned to Lord of the Rings so perfectly we couldn't. But King isn't just a, a fan of Lord of the Rings. Like King is a fan of literature, especially genre literature. He loves fantasy. He sees horror as just a, a, a wing of fantasy fiction. Uh-huh. So he considers himself a fantasy writer. Um and so I think in the grand tradition of a bunch of different fantasy stories, Lud is not just a pl- like a Lord of the Rings place. Like this is, you know, boggarts and trolls and orcs, like some things that were made up by Tolkien, but some things that weren't. And like, like, I, I, I just I don't I, I want to say that I want to acknowledge that while we're making direct comparisons to Lord of the Rings, like not everything is a Lord sure. of the like specific Lord of the Rings thing. It's just fantasy adventure fiction that king is kind of co-opting in certain moments to 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 explore in his world and and fairy tale you know which yeah fairy tale yeah which, which, which is, is like the that's folk, tolkien yeah yeah which i mean folk i think folk tale is, is a very powerful thing like yes yes the, i mean honestly Tol- tolkien is inspired by 
folktale as well. That is literally what he's trying to do. He's he's riffing on these things. He didn't invent like um I mean he didn't he didn't invent trolls, but he uses trolls in, in Lord yeah, of the Rings. Yeah. Um um yeah, yeah, he considers Lord of the Rings a fairy story. Yeah. Well, I don't know if he would call Lord of the Rings a fairy story. I mean, he writes he write, I mean he had like on fairy stories is a, a wonderful essay he wrote. Everyone yeah. should read that. It's fascinating. Um Yeah, I th- thought I, I think he would, but now I'm not sure now that you've that you posed it that way. <laughs> um yeah, no, it, it's um I, I mean the, the Hansel and Gretel reference from earlier is is clearly like, yeah, that's that's just folklore. That's uh, mm-hmm. um yeah, I mean I, I it's interesting because I do find myself wondering like if the greys are the orcs, are the pubes just like more orcs who don't happen to live in the tunnels? Yeah, or, the or greys like, are the urukai and the pubes are the shitty orcs. <laughs> the sh- sh- shitty Moria goblins who, yeah. who die in one second. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, sure. <laughs> I mean, I was, try- I was reaching for something to, to <laughs> m- maybe figure out if there was something else going on, but, but I, I'm not, not sure that there is really. Yeah. Um, yeah. We actually, Matt, had a listener who emailed us and let us know that uh, because of our incessant Lord of the Rings talk, they have decided to give the Lord of the Rings book series another shot, which is very exciting uh, because I think both you and I adore those books. Yeah. Um, I, I will say that they're, they're, Tolkien's prose style is very different from a lot of modern fantasy um, and and this book as well. Um, he just writes differently. He's He writes like it's a historical account because that's what he's trying to do. He's very specific and precise in his language. And sometimes it's not the most like exciting to read, but I think it's still beautiful, beautiful language. Yeah. And there are certainly parts of it where I, I, I mean, they're just as good as anything else. Um, sure. You know, sure, like yeah. I remember just the, the, especially return of the King just like really affecting me, you yeah. know, emotionally. So it's great. I just, uh, I, I try to read them every few years. I just, I did an audiobook version last year of all three and it's just like it's beautiful oh it's beautiful yeah i i, I, I haven't yeah I, I need to i haven't reread them in probably 15 years so oh you should yeah. you should i think you'd appreciate them so much more now yeah i, I think i will um, i think i will yeah anyway so congratulations for starting lord of the rings hope you love it um let's move on yeah <laughs> So Gasher and Jake finally get to the large door guarding TikTok's lair, which we'll learn a bit later is called actually the Cradle of the Greys, um, which is interesting, you know, considering our conversation about cradles a, l- a little bit ago. Yeah. Um, they try to get in, but Gasher can't remember the password. Fortunately, Hoots, Gasher's lover, takes care of Gasher and, and wrote the password down on a scrap of paper, but Gasher can't read Matt. So Jake has to read it for him. The password is bountiful, which I think um, is is just a charged word in this regard. Uh-huh. Like, like what in this world is bountiful? Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's like, great. That you just you just get this idea of like a, a crop of like a t- teeming life, you know, like right. like just it, it just seems like bountiful and wasteland just uh-huh. aren't aren't words that go together at all absolutely i mean it's the kind of thing where you can imagine like tiktok is the one selecting the passwords and he's just doing a bit of like um you know managing his his people by being mm-hmm. like the password today is bountiful and you'll yes. have no trouble remembering it because that is what i bring to you all yes. is, is the bounty <laughs> yeah. of of my largesse and and that kind of thing Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Um, So a bit of a way behind them and gaining are Roland and Oi, who know they're closing in by the singing that they hear. So Uh awesome. Thanks for the singing, Gasher. Great. Um, So the only reason I'm really talking about this little blurb where we cut back to Roland and Oi briefly is this part right here where the text says, and just as they reached the shaft, which led to the lower levels of this Dicean maze, Roland had heard the sound of some new machine, a pump of some sorts, perhaps, followed by the metallic echoing crash of a door being slammed shut. So that is uh, Gasher and Jake walking past the double uh, sealed door into the inner part of the cradle. Um, But but he uses this phrase here, Matt. Uh-huh. Dicey and maze. What is that? Never heard the word, Scott. Why don't you tell me what dicey and is? It, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I spent I uh-huh. spent upwards of an hour looking up what dicey and could possibly mean. It is something that King has made up himself. And and if you see, I have the text copied right here in front of us. Uh-huh. It is proper. It is a capitalized word. Dicey and maze are is a proper noun. Um, 
I don't I don't yeah. know. Not not just capital Dicean, but capital Maze too, yes. as if it's yes. referring to a specific thing. Yeah. Um yeah, like that's what's funny. <laughs> I mean, this isn't very nice of me, but I do wonder if like King just misremembered something <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then left it in that way. Or sure, or sure. it could very well be that like Roland, like this is we're in Roland's head maybe. And and like Roland is thinking of a particular reference. That's not that's not normally a, like normally there'd be some kind of flag that like, ah, yes, the, the maze of dice, which was the story of the. Right, right. No, we don't get that at all. Um, yeah, any time in this book, especially this book in particular, we've gotten some drop of mythology from Roland's world. The book has usually paused briefly to to explain it to us a little bit, um, and it does not here. So, yeah, I mean, it's very possible that the Dicean Maze is just a, a, a location in roland world mythology um that we haven't heard about yet but i really went i went crazy on this and like I, i'm trying to like like stretch my brain around it like because the one thing like if if you pronounce it Dissian, right uh -huh. then you could go like like odyssean because odyssean is a word it's spelled differently than it is here but like to describe like a a, a long journey um because of the odyssey um and so i was like maybe this is like roland's version of the myth of the uh, and i went i went like freaking galaxy brain here because i was just trying to figure out what this what this possibly could mean but no i mean it's just a it's just a kingism that we'll probably never know the answer to i mean even i have i have the dark tower companion um book here uh -huh. and, and it, it doesn't even have a, an entry for this so <laughs> Um, not even they cared what this meant. This is just seems like I found a couple like forums where people were like, hey, what is that? What does this mean? So I'm not the only one, but I'm one of very few. It, it's pretty funny. I, I mean, on a level, it's fun. It's fun to know that there's stuff like this in the book. Um, I, ju I just sure. looked up Crete because I was like, OK, Minotaur Maze Crete. Is it is it like another word for Crete? Yeah, no, I thought that too. To no, no. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Because, yeah, I mean, like even if it is supposed to be Odyssean, like there's not a maze in the Odyssey, so no. like it doesn't quite work. I mean, you could say that like they got lost on the way home and had trouble finding the way home. So that's maze. I don't know. Like I was and, really I was really stretching. here. And what would that have to do? And, and like I, I hear you, but what would that have to do with like this being a dark winding maze? That, yeah, nothing. Nothing. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So that's just something we're just going to maybe we'll get an email from someone who'll be like, oh, I know exactly what it is. King said in an interview and I'll be like, why did I miss that? Yeah. I spent so much time. But if <laughs> please let me know, please, like, yeah. if you know, I would love to hear it. I'd love to know, too. Yeah. Yeah. So we go back with Eddie and Susanna entering the cradle. Um, the two race to the top of the steps, which is kind of funny because Susanna is just using her her upper arm strength because uh -huh. she cannot climb. Um, and she, Eddie beats her by like a step, but is like wiped like he's exhausted uh -huh. um and i think once again like we've been kind of talking about how Susanna is this this badass character and i love the little moments where we get to reinforce that which is not to diminish eddie at all but Susanna's awesome she's yeah. awesome yeah no that's a it's a fun moment it, it's interesting um how like they are uh well they're becoming very uh kid like here aren't they yeah like yeah. They're, they're playing and then they become really horny in a second mm -hmm. um yeah I, I don't know it is interesting yeah because like he picks her up to put her back in the chair and then he like embraces her for too long and they basically just go and uh, no we don't have time for this here yeah right <laughs> yeah yeah I, like I, I do kind of want to even talk about it for a second like why, why are they so like almost inappropriately lusty in this situation like I mean, I guess sometimes this just happens between people like sure. like it doesn't necessarily need a, a like a big explanation. But um, I just wondered if there was one, you know, like like what what's going on here that makes them suddenly get super horny. Um, yeah, I, I mean, know. I wish I had an easy answer for you. I, I, I don't I mean, I think probably it's just the pressure of the situation. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I also think like on a certain level, they did see that couple of Jeeves and uh, I forgot the other the woman's name now mod um mod and they like walked off like hand in hand like there's there's real love there mm -hmm. and maybe that just had an effect on them um but yeah, yeah i mean I, I i totally agree with you that like it seems deliberate and turned up to a level that 
draws your attention to right. not just that it's happening, but like making yourself, well, why? Why right now? Right. It, it almost seems like they're both sort of considering, like, could we just sneak off into that alcove over there for mm -hmm. 15 minutes? But right, right. Yeah. Um, which is like, really? Now? <laughs> Rolling a <laughs> Jake or off <laughs> somewhere in the city? And yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. To, to really speculate to go out there, um, they are pretty convinced at this point that they're never going to see Roland and Jake again. Uh -huh. And so it's like it's down to the two of us now. And uh -huh. so maybe we're like seeing them pay more more close attention to their interpersonal bond because they've their group has fractured and it's just them now. Yeah. And suddenly we're all we each other has now. I yeah. Don't know. Yeah. Maybe so. I like, I like that, too. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think it even needs a, a big, complicated explanation. It was just no, something no. that I figured it would be interesting to talk about. Sure, sure, sure. So Eddie and Susanna walk into the building and see a large sign with a familiar company name, North Central Positronics. Here they are again, Matt. Um, we also finally learn that there were indeed two trains. The one found in the river was a train named Patricia. The one heading in the direction our tet needs to go is, of course, Blaine. Uh-huh. Um, and as they walk up into the concourse, they see a series of sculptured heads pushing out of the marble of the walls. And I love the writing here. High up on the wall, a series of sculpted heads seem to push out of the marble, peering down at them from the shadows. Stern men with the harsh faces of executioners who are happy in their work. Some of the faces had fallen from those places and lay in granite shards and splinters 70 or 80 feet below their piers. Those remaining were spiderwebbed with cracks and splattered with pigeon dung. And I love that Susanna sees all of this and says out loud to herself, a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, Susanna murmured. And at those words, Eddie felt goose flesh waltz across the skin of his arms, chest and legs. So, Matt, um, at this point, would it surprise you at all to learn that Susanna is quoting a line from T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland? No, I think I even <laughs> might have assumed it. Um, one thing yeah. I wasn't clear on is like, does she is does she know that's what she's quoting i think so i mean okay. she says she says something a poem written by a man who yeah. must have seen lud i think is what she's yeah saying. yeah okay so it, yeah she's not just like speaking in tongues here she yeah, yeah. she knows this quote um yeah which, and this poem yeah. this poem came out in uh 1920 something so um because i think elliot was dead by the time by Susanna's time i think i think so i don't know um, I think I want to spend some time talking about this poem now, Matt. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't read all of it and I don't understand half of what I have read. As we talked about, I am terrible at poems. But here is the the part of the poem that Susanna is quoting from. It says, what are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you only know a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief and the dry stone no sound of water. So basically, Eliot is describing like a ruin, like mm -hmm. a ruin of civilization, which is exactly what Ludd is. And Eliot wrote this poem um, basically in the aftermath of World War One, like seeing what civilization did to itself in the, the First World War. Um, and like you can kind of imagine like seeing the wreckage of, of the cities after like the horrible, horrible violence that happened and writing about the world as a wasteland. And I mean, that kind of fits with what we're seeing here, right? Like Middle Earth, Middle Earth, Midworld is kind of a wasteland like there is a there is a pocket of this place called the wastelands and we're gonna get there but midworld is itself a, a kind of wasteland lud is the center of this wasteland of 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 wreckage of destruction of the remnants of civilization of of rubbish um a heap of broken images the sun beats the dead tree gives no shelter the crickets no relief the dry stone no sound of water um this is lud this is midworld or parts the parts of midworld we've seen um and so that is i think exactly i think that kind of helps us get a handle on some of the themes of this book, this this idea of civilization in ruin, a civilization that ruined itself um, and the remnants, uh, the people living in the remnants of of that dead world, because that's everyone we've seen so far. Yeah, uh, I mean, absolutely perfect. Yeah, um, I, I so I, I intentionally didn't really look too much into the poem, The Wasteland until, or, you know, up till now, because 
I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know if it might like be spoilerish in some way. Like it might contain information that I would prefer not to have. But I really think, especially after we finish this book, maybe even before we finish it, I'm going to want to read this poem and think about it because Mm -hmm. I mean, what you just described, you're exactly right. Like thematically, if King wanted to write a story about this collapsed dead world, you know, a, a shell of its former self due to some great war, uh, this is exactly the poem that you would use as your kind of touchstone. Yep. Um, yep. Yep. So yeah, I, I want to go read it basically. No. Yeah. I, it's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a struggle, but I'm going to try to read it as well because I, I think, I think the way I, I mean the problem with this poem, it has a lot of German in it, which I don't speak. Um, and it makes a lot of references that I'm not aware of. And so it's kind of like this part of the poem I think is the easiest to parse that I pulled out here and we, and I read, but, um, I think it's worth the time and I, I agree with you. I want to, I want to do that. So maybe we'll come back for our overview episode, have poem under our belts and maybe talk about it for a little bit. It's a good idea. All right. So finally they see the demon train on the cover of the book, Matt, the train that's hounded Jake since the beginning. It's Blaine. It was pink. Just as Eddie had said it would be, a delicate shade which matched the veins running through the marble pillars. Blaine flowed above the wide loading platform in a smooth, streamlined bullet shape, which looked more like flesh than metal. Its surface was broken only once by a triangular window equipped with a huge wiper. Eddie knew there would be another triangular window with another big wiper on the other side of the mono's nose, so that if you looked at Blaine head-on, it would seem to have a face, just like Charlie the Choo Choo. The wipers would be look like slyly drooping eyelids. <laughs> uh, it's really fascinating. Uh, so he does have a kind of face like Charlie, um, mm-hmm. even even like Charlie in the sense of kind of like seemingly friendly, but but also vaguely sinister. Um, it, it kind of has that quality of like uh, a sleeping dog or a dog pretending to be asleep, which is a, a reference we've had a couple times. Um, but but it doesn't look anything like the demonic train on the cover. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, um, not at all. Like it, that, which even makes me wonder: like, is he going to transform when they're in the wastelands, or like, was that an image from a dream? Like, why would you put the de- demonic train on the cover if there's no actual? Okay, whatever. But um, I mean, here's here's what I'll say about cover art: um, the author is never involved in it. Yeah, fair. ever. Um, if you say, "All right, we need to do a cover art for this book," uh, here's the here's the Cliff Notes version of the book. Here's the list. Oh, demon train and uh-huh. an artist just runs with that and uh-huh. makes what they what they would assume a demon train would look like uh-huh. you um, can just imagine king looking at that and just being like why sure sure yeah, yeah i mean my 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 train is literally like a sleek stylish pink l- futuristic monorail like yeah. that's yeah um but still ominous in that way and it's yeah. funny because like the train actually looks less like charlie and looks more like the trains that replaced charlie uh-huh. like even True. though we're specifically linking charlie the choo-choo and blaine the mono together um it looks different yeah yeah <laughs> interesting now, um, now i'm going wild with with that little tidbit okay. there you okay. just go you just go wild man just okay. go wild. i love i love the description here though like look it looked more flesh than metal it just makes you uncomfortable like uh-huh. it just like it, it's just everything about it makes you uncomfortable and, and i didn't pull this but there's a part where like um eddie sees that like the signs one saying patricia one saying blaine and the patricia one is blue and the blaine one is pink and eddie's like oh they got the color mixed colors mixed up because patricia's a girl's name blah 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 which uh-huh. is just eddie being eddie but like i think like it's so kind of disarming like we this train has been built up for like the whole book basically yeah. since chapter two and while there is still some ominousness here it just looks like a monorail. Right. It's, it's like a m- pink. It's like a pink monorail, a delicate shade. Like that's such a with a word usage there, a delicate shade of pink. Yeah, he could have made it black. He could have made it mm-hmm. silver, like like almost any color. Yeah, <laughs> is yeah. more is more scary. But like, but I think that's that's the point. Is like it, it's mm-hmm. it's it's eerie. It's weird for it to be pink. I yeah. mean, I mean, I've never seen a pink train in real life it's a weird color to make a train honestly it's like what are you why why is it pink why what are you trying to communicate by making it pink so yeah i don't know it's a weird this is a weird society though it's kind of like it's a weird idea in the first place to have like 
your train be an AI train. Well, and to name it too, yeah. like, like, yes. like our society would just say the Northwest train, we'd probably give it a number like the Northwest 103 or something and the Southeast, blah, blah, blah. But they've given them name. They've like, they've given it an AI and they've given it a personality and they've like named it. And like, yeah, it, it, it certainly is interesting. Yeah. It's, it's funny because like where, where I live, like you might, you might refer to a train as the Lincoln train because it, it, it's last stop is in Lincoln. <laughs> but um but you don't think of the train as being named lincoln <laughs> right right it's, yeah uh it, yeah it's, like yeah. no sign would say left to lincoln <laughs> right yes yeah 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 uh the two find a security system for blaine and eddie decides to hit the talk listen switch and well beat eddie he puts on an accent and channels his inner richie tozier which is my weekly it reference i did it again and says Hello, Blaine. Cheerio, old fellow. This is Robin Leach, host of Lifestyles of the Rich and Brainless, here to tell you that you have won six billion dollars and a new Ford Escort in the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes. It's so funny to me here, Matt, because like they were terrified. Yeah. They were terrified. And this is what Eddie does when he gets uncomfortable. He just like turns into this kind of loud talking, um, non-thinking person. And like Susanna's like, what the fuck are you yeah, doing? Right. Shut up. Horrified. Yeah. yeah. I, I love the description of Susanna's reaction here where she's just like, she's, she's too stunned to even react and stop him. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, it's, it's great. But Eddie is stopped not by Susanna freaking out, but by a childish voice coming out of the speaker in front of them, warning them not to wake Blaine up. This voice has a, a pink light associated with it and refers to itself as Little Blaine. I'm Little Blaine, the child's voice whispered, the one he doesn't see, the one he forgot, the one he thinks he left behind in the rooms of ruin and the halls of the dead. So... Uh, more fun connections here, Matt. Here, Little Blaine is quoting the same thing that Eddie quoted the first time he got near the portal at the edge of the beam. And again, when he summoned Jake, this is that that line he's quoting here, um, which I believe we said was just a King poem invention. This is not from the Wastelands. This is just a thing that King made up. And now we have Little Blaine quoting it. So what was that? What's that mean? <laughs> I mean, that seems like a pretty big question, actually. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Like it's, it's, <laughs> it, it, it seems like, uh, it seems like a lot's going on with this halls of the dead thing and a lot's going on with this whole, I, I, I'm going to need to step back and talk about like the setting actually, sure. because like, it seems like Blaine is much more than just the train. Like he seems mm -hmm. to be able to control all these things throughout the city. Like, like why can a train release poison gas? Right. Right. That's, that's weird. Um, so my first thought is that there's a bunch of AIs and maybe Blaine, little, little Blaine is just like another AI, like may, maybe like, you know, the city and or the train are, are run by a cohort of AIs. Big Blaine is just like the one that was the most ruthless and insane of the AIs. And so he like destroyed all the others except for one that, that escaped. And that's little Blaine who would be like smaller and weaker and managed to hide somewhere. I don't mm -hmm. know. I'm, 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 I'm riffing here. Um, these recent chapters have made it very clear, though, that, that Blaine is indeed an, an AI. He's not a ghost. Mm -hmm. He's he's just a mach he's just an AI. He's just a very old AI who's sort of lost the plot um, and gotten fixated on on riddles and just wants to be entertained. Basically, the, the city's ghosts are either just Blaine fucking with them or perhaps other AIs. Um, but basically, it's AIs. It's all AIs. It's all AI. Shardik mm -hmm. may have been an AI. Hard to say for sure. I mean, he definitely had something like that going on sure um, the, the point is though like we're in this world of demons magic doorways and we've introduced this very like hard sci-fi idea and that forces me to ask like what if this is all related what if this is all the same thing in a sense what if mm. the demons and the beam and the Ka and the tower and shardik and the house on dutch hill are all like ais or, or at least like technological in some way like, what if this is all part of the cataclysm, this, this like high tech disaster that spans the future and the past? It's so high tech that it borders into fantasy. That's all I got. Yeah, that's really cool. I like that a lot. And I, I think I think I like wor the things that your brain is connecting. I obviously can't tell you like uh -huh. you're, sure. you're spot on or you're way off. I can't say anything like that. But I, I like the connections that your brain is making here. Um, I, I mean, like, I think we are being 
prodded to see a connection between the beam, the portal, Shardik, and this thing. I, I think that's what quoting these Halls of the Dead, this this repeated refrain of this kind of poem that um, Henry, Henry, that Eddie heard when he got near that portal door um, and that machine. Um, I think we're being kind of told by King or, or forced by King to to draw these lines between these things with this repeated refrain yeah. that we've heard. So, yeah, I mean, I think your, your brain is definitely in the right place yeah. at, as far as drawing lines between all these things for yeah. sure. Uh, specifically, as you say there, like the, the beam strikes you as fantasy, except, you know, and a giant bear also kind of strikes you as fantasy, except it's a cyborg bear. Mm-hmm. And now this AI knows about the magic words that came out of the beam door. So right, like, right. like, like some kind of magical fantasy crossover melding is, is almost definitely happening. It's just what, what is the nature of it and, and all of that, that I, that I don't really understand yet. Sure. Sure. Great. Well, we'll keep that in mind as we continue to learn more about all this mystical technological stuff. Cool. So big Blaine is awake, Matt. Uh huh. And speaking in all caps, <laughs> The uh, command and enter box says light up in a dark red to to specify Blaine, L- big Blaine, as little Blaine called him, um, which, again, I think is kind of showing that your brain's in the right place with the stuff, because like little Blaine's pink button matches the pink of the train. Right. Uh-huh. But big Blaine is not pink. Big Blaine is red. So yeah. we're, we're drawing some differences here. Um, and big Blaine like demands to know who they are and why they're here. And we see almost immediately that Blaine is, um, weird. Uh-huh. <laughs> that after they prove that they come from New York, which Blaine seems to know about, he's aware of New York city. He starts speaking like John Wayne back to them. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then he a- demands that they ask him a question. They don't understand what, what he means at first, but it becomes very clear that he wants a riddle. So unlike Charlie, who the, the quote in Charlie the Choo Choo was, ask me no more questions, I'll play no silly games. It seems like Blaine wa- is the exact opposite of that, where he wants you to ask him silly questions. He wants to play in silly games. He's not just a simple choo-choo train, and he'll, and it'll never stay that way. <laughs> yeah, it makes me wonder if like Charlie is another personality, like an, another AI that we might even meet. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, that's that, cool. That, yeah. That's, that's interesting. But I mean, the John Wayne stuff, like Blaine absolutely knows what New York City is. Yeah. 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 Like that's clear. So because the, the, the way they get their, his attention is they say Statue of Liberty. Yeah. <laughs> and he's but, like, go on. Right. So uh, we don't know how. We don't know why. Blaine knows about New York City. Nobody else in this world really does. Uh, except Roland, I guess. But yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, Roland tangentially, though, like he knows yeah. about it only because he's been there. He did not know about it yeah. before his his trip. Yeah. I'm sure we're going to f- figure out more about why Blaine knows these things, though. OK, cool. So we go from the Cradle of Lud over to the Cradle of the Greys. Jake finds himself in a pill shaped silo surrounded by tubes of neon of all colors. At the center of the room is a massive man who looks like, quote, a cross between a Viking warrior and a giant from a child's fairy tale. His heavily muscled upper body was naked except for a silver band around one bicep, a knife scabbard looped over one shoulder and a strange charm about his neck. His lower body was clad in soft, tight-fitting leather breeches, which were tucked into high boots. He wore a yellow scarf tied around one of these. His hair, a dirty gray blonde, cascaded almost to the middle of his broad back. His eyes were as green and curious as the eyes of a tomcat, who is old enough to be wise, but not old enough to have lost the refined sense of cruelty which passes for fun in feline circles. Hung by its strap from the back of the chair was what looked like a very old machine gun. This is the TikTok man, the only person besides Jake in this entire room, maybe this entire city, who looks, quote, wholly vital, wholly healthy, and wholly alive. He's also wholly insane, Matt. Uh, he kills one of his minions just just for laughing, uh-huh. he, like scarily quick. Yeah. I mean, talk about great character introductions, just mm-hmm. just like great wordsmithing and what you just read um, hits you, you know, descriptively in terms of what he looks like how worried we should be about him. Um, I I love how King will compare things to animals to, Mm -hmm. to emphasize their scariness. Like the house crouched like a dog pretending to be asleep. He he has the eyes of a Tomcat. Like, like we have this, we have a deep rooted 
uh, connection between wild animals and fear and danger. Yeah. And King is is very reliable about tapping into that, I think. And it's not just the eyes of a tomcat, which I think like would get across a certain amount of information. If you just said his eyes were as green and curious as the eyes of a tomcat and then stopped the sentence there, I think you'd get a picture. Yeah. But then he carries that forward, who is old enough to be wise, but not enough to have lost that refined sense of cruelty. So like he's smart, but he's cruel at yeah. the same time and like yeah. which is exactly what we see throughout him and the rest of right. this thing he's he's not an idiot he's not stupid I, it, um yeah everyone else in this room is stupid <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the tiktok man is is healthy alive smart he's everything we were led to believe doesn't exist in the city anymore yeah it's 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 really great i mean he, he seems supernatural just mm-hmm. just by virtue of being normal in in this right. setting um, yeah. Also, he seems to be like superhumanly fast and strong and, and stuff, but not yeah. not to a degree where it's like unrealistic, I guess. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, no, I, I love I love the description so much like it. it uh, so much of King's writing and writing in general is like painting moods. Mm. And by describing, you know, a Tom cat and the sense of cruelty, you sort of involuntarily imagine like a cat you know, doing that thing where they play with a mouse and they like pretend they're going to let it go and they catch it again. And like, yeah, th- yeah, that's in your mind as you're thinking about this character. And then those two ideas are bound together. And that's how he's formed this character in your head. So, so quickly. Mm, yeah. It's great. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's really barely in this book, but he has such a presence. Yeah. Immediately. Yeah. Right. Well, he, he feels like something we've been building up to. Sure. Sure. For a long time. So, yeah. Yeah. So TikTok is immediately interested in Jake's Seiko watch. I've actually never said the name of that watch company out loud. I think is it's that, Seiko, I, but now now you make me realize that I don't know why I think that. <laughs> I mean, you probably heard it in the audiobook, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> I think I think it is Seiko. I think you're right because okay. it's 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 Japanese, right? It's a yeah, Japanese. Yeah. Company, yeah. Um this is the, the same watch that isn't even telling the proper time now that they're in Midworld. Remember like this is the first thing Jake the first in the first chapter of Jake in Midworld in the book, we have him commenting on this watch. It's not even working anymore. Um, and it, suddenly TikTok is super interested in this watch. And I just love how the TikTok man talks here. Like we just talked about his description, but he still kind of talks in the piratey, like come here, Cully type of language that everyone other uh, the Greys uses. But he's still like talks differently from the rest of them. Like one of the things I forgot to talk about last week is, is kind of the clockwork orangey nature of the nonsense words that we see from Gasher. Um, you've seen clockwork orange, right? Yeah. 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 So like they, they have like the, they, these ruffians, these kids have this whole other language that they speak in and Gasher kind of like his language kind of reminds me of that sometimes, but TikTok doesn't quite talk like that. Like so he still uses some words, but like he's not, as n- almost indecipherable as Gasher and the rest of the Greys are. Yeah, right. He he almost seems to be like he's from another world. Like he he's he's smarter. He's stronger. Um, it really does seem to just be like a bloodline thing. But um, I don't know. Like there's something going on with this guy. He's not mm-hmm. just he's he's not like a normal. He's not just one of them who who happened to take control. Like he's got, there's something more going on with his, with his story. I yeah. Think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jake all at once realizes here that, that, that he, this giant man must be David Quick's grandson. So this is the, the man that climbed into the airplane that we heard talk about since the beginning of chapter four. Right. Um, great grandson, actually. He guesses yeah. grandson, but it's great grandson. Um, so yeah, I mean like there's already some otherworldly mythology to his great grandfather, David Quick, and he's a descendant of that line. And that seems, that seems to have stayed that, that otherworldliness seems to have stayed with him. Yeah. Um, I love that he makes the mistake of randomly quoting the Lord Perth story that Roland told them earlier and TikTok like freaks the fuck out and launches him across the room. Yeah. And he calls it a bad luck story, which I find delightful because like to any human being on this planet, the story of David and Goliath is a story of success, of triumph, of the little guy conquering over impossible odds, right? Like that's, that's, it's become synonymous for that concept. But to people like Andrew Quick, the TikTok man, it's a bad luck story, a cautionary tale of how you, the great and powerful leader, could be taken down by someone small. 
Yeah, no, that, that is hilarious. It definitely struck me a certain way since since our conversation about how Jake serves as a great example of the David uh, to TikTok to TikTok's Goliath. Um, mm-hmm. um, uh, I, th- I think I think last week I said something like, "Yeah, bringing this up here it makes me wonder if if um, if if Jake isn't going to serve as as a David and bring down a Goliath." Mm-hmm. Uh, except except now after having read the chapter, I wonder if um, Oi is not the David actually. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe. He does rip his eye out. That's a uh-huh. does. Can I? I'm trying to remember the David and Goliath story. Does he? I know he he brains him with a rock, right? From a sling. Does right. it go through his eyeball? I don't. Or does it just clanks off his head? I honestly I think can't it just, remember. I think it just cracks his skull. I mean, I, yeah. I don't know if the I don't know if the story is that specific. Um, yeah. I don't. I, I don't. I don't remember an eyeball popping out. I feel, I feel like my, I feel like I remember that. <laughs> Sometimes you just want the connection to be there so badly that your uh-huh. brain just makes shit up. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, all of a sudden though Jake sees Oi's golden eyes coming out of a vent in the back Roland is here but they they can't get in um, Roland tries to see through Jake's eyes using their Cotet mind meld but he reminds us again here that he isn't a full member of the Cotet and uh, it seems that that is more than just Roland's insecurity here Remember, I, we talked about that at the time that maybe Roland just kind of felt removed from them and he was having trouble seeing them as people and so th- him saying he's not a full member was representative of that insecurity or inability but it seems like there's some mystical um, proof positive of this idea that they are connected to each other closely more closely than he is connected to them uh-huh. Um, because he, I think he says here that Oi has a better, better mental connection to the boy than he does, uh-huh. um, which is why he here sends Oi into the vent, and that that's why Jake saw him there because he sent him. Makes sense. But Oi proves his quality here because uh-huh. he comes back and Roland says, "How many Oi? How many do you see?" For a long moment, he thought the bumbler wouldn't do anything except go on staring in his anxious way. Then he lifted his right paw tentatively in the air, extending the claws, and looked at it, as if trying to remember something very difficult. At last, he began to tap on the steel floor. One, two, three, four. A pause. Then two more, quick and delicate, the extended claws clicking lightly on the steel. Five, six. Oi paused a second time, head down, looking like a child lost in the throes of some titanic mental struggle. Then he tapped his claws one final time on the steel, looking up at Roland as he did. Ake! Six grays. And Jake. <laughs> so I, I love this. O- Oi is obviously pretty smart here. Um, and I love, like, it's not like he's just smart. Like, this is still really, really hard for him. Yeah. Although the first time I read this, when he lifted his paw into the air, I swear to God, I thought he was about to like hold up fingers. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> he doesn't have digits. Right. Well, that's it, it's it's funny because th- this is probably my most uh, ridiculous theory of the day. But like it made me wonder here, especially the way it's described as him like trying to remember something. If Oi is not like a reincarnation of like a person um, because... Oh. OK, because that would explain why he can like sort of talk, but like he's forgotten. He's forgotten. He's forgotten all of his his life, except for maybe like snippets here and there. But like it would explain why he wants to hang out with people. But mm. a more a more simple theory might just be that he did interact with people at some point in the past and thus he knows some things. Mm-hmm. Or it could just be that he's just a really unusual Billy Bumbler and that's yeah. it. There's nothing else to it. We do have precedents from the people of river crossing that billy bumblers did like were t- said to have been able to do sums yeah. so like counting and and numbers is like it's not something that king has just introduced out of the blue here true he did he did yeah. like slyly set it up for right. us it's, but it's not like if a dog was shown to be counting <laughs> right, right, you'd right. be like all right it's a magic dog <laughs> right, something's right, going on with right. the dog yeah uh, yeah so yeah um, always pretty smart uh he's connected to jake in this way he's able to count he gives them a count of the people it would be uh, a shame to send him to his death or something. Yeah. You'd hate to send him to his death to accomplish your mission. Like the Hawk that you had, whose name was David. Oh shit. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, that's why, that's why always the David always, mm, yeah. always, but, but, but again, it's so foolish to, to like waste this, this precious thing. I think that's maybe that's even the way Roland thinks about it. He's like, ah, oh, yes, I guess, I guess always here to be used up here so that I can save Jake. Mm-hmm. Like he's, he's, 
man, like this is the one quality about Roland where we, we like we as the readers are just like, come on, man. Yeah. You, like, like, stop, stop using people up like this. Like, like there's a better way to go about it. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, it, it is like I get it. And I think Oi would have wanted to do it, whether or not Roland told him to or not. But I think I think there is something to the casual nature with which Roland goes okay, I guess this is what I got to do now. Send in Oi. Yep. And he's definitely going to die. Like we, there is no doubt in Roland's mind when he sends him that he's sending him to his death. Like the text makes that very clear. Like, yeah, Oi is going to die. Here we go. Did you, I mean, did you think in this moment that, oh shit, Oi's going to die here? Yeah. Yeah, I, I did. I think that's one pretty clever thing that King is sort of set up in this story is that I'm weirdly willing to believe the characters will die. <laughs> uh, 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 because he did this shocking thing in the first book of mm-hmm. killing Jake. Now, of course, he brought Jake back, um, but it spent long enough that we really were like, wow, he's really willing to take people out. Um, right, right. And even, I mean, the thing about killing characters and then bringing them back is you can either do it cheaply where it just feels like what was the point of even doing that? <clears throat> game of thrones um or you can do what i thought this book did which even though yes jake died and we brought him back there were clear consequences to that that changed and morphed the entire story around that loss um and that's that's when i'm okay with it like i i, I like death to be permanent but also like i get it like I, like if you earn it if you make it have consequences it's fine with me yes i <sighs> It, yeah, I think the way that that was used in the story works perfectly for me. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Cool. I interrupted you. Sorry, were you saying um, something else? No, I think I was done with that. Okay. So we go back with Blaine. The mono has told them to ask a question or die. Eddie tries asking about itself. Who built it? What does it want? But it's Susanna that finally solves the puzzle. She asks Blaine a riddle. And your prediction, Matt, was spot on here. Blaine, the mono, loves riddles yep yep thank you please send your congratulations to kingslingerspot at gmail.com um <laughs> i you know it's, it's funny because I, I i called it i called blaine the sphinx and i was like i was really hoping there'd be more of a direct sphinx connection but mm. like i really can't find anything like this the sphinx like asks one, one riddle the sphinx doesn't really like enjoy riddles doesn't enjoy solving riddles sure so it's not really there if there is a comparison it's the Gollum comparison. It's the the riddles in the dark chapter where yeah. there's this creature that it's just going to kill Bilbo. And then it's like, oh, oh, we can have a riddle game. That's that's way more fun. I haven't had any, anybody to play with in forever. Like that. I think I think Gollum, if, if there's going to be a reference, uh, Blaine is just sh- sh- straight up Gollum. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is a great character because he's also like, you know, he's got he's a, a person with two minds. And we've got Blaine, 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 and, uh, Big Blaine and Little Blaine. Um, yeah, yeah. So maybe the little little Blaine is our Smeagol here. We also have this idea that Blaine the AI was corrupted over time in the, in similar ways to the way Shardik did that like yeah. it became cruel and insane over time. It wasn't built to that way. Yeah. Um Yeah. That's all very interesting cuz that's the Hobbit. That's not even that's not even Lord of the Rings, but sure, sure. sure. sure, it, it, sure. It, well, there's no reason to to be to be linear with things. Sure. Uh Susanna tells the Blaine the riddle that they discussed over the fire that one night the one that none of them could remember there is a thing that nothing is and yet it has a name it's sometimes tall and sometimes short joins our talks joins our sport and plays at every game Blaine answers almost immediately a shadow Um, but he is amused by them and so he spares them correct like right now he wants more riddles and the two luckily are like, oh, we have a friend that has a whole book full of riddles and another friend who like did them for fun this whole time. So br- the, we'll get you those guys and, and you'll be happy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what struck me and, and no, I, I did not look this up. And so it's it's very easy for me to just be embarrassed and wrong. But like, is Shadow the right answer? I'm not actually asking you because I don't want to know. <laughs> um, like, what does Shadow have to do with sports and, and talks like? I, I, as soon as Blaine said that, I was like, that doesn't sound right. And, and and then I was like, well, maybe he's just wrong. And then later Roland is going to be like, no, that wasn't the right answer. And then like use that against him somehow. I don't know. Um, again, this, this is the fun of this show is, is I get the opportunity to embarrass myself by 
um, making ridiculous statements like that. But, but I like, I, I, it just, it like, as soon as he said a shadow, I was like, how is that the answer to that riddle? <laughs> so anyway, anyway. All right. Um, so next we have this more bland characterization here where they're saying that Roland has knows the best riddles and the riddles in this book are the most complicated, wonderful riddles. And Blaine calls them liars. And they're like, how do you know that? And he says, voice analysis, frictive patterns and diphthong stress emphasis provide a reliable quotient of truth, untruth, predictable, predictive reliability, 97 percent plus or minus 0.5 percent. The voice fell silent for a moment. And when it spoke again, it did so in a menacing draw that Eddie found very familiar. It was the voice of Humphrey Bogart. I suggest you stick to what you know, sweetheart. The last guy that tried shading the truth with me wound up at the bottom of the send in a pair of cement cowboy boots. So, again, pop culture references from our world Uh what's going on with blaine the mono (laughs) i think blaine's been like watching tv through a portal or something like that but how and why and what i don't know um it's crazy i love it yeah yeah blaine is definitely a pain but also insane Uh and unlike shardik it seems that this machine does not have a little radar dish on the top of it you can just shoot off of it they ask blaine if he'll take them to the southeast to where they need to go and he says, maybe um, you got to do something for me first. And what he asked them turns out to be another riddle. You'll have to prime the pump to get me going. And my pump primes backward. Yeah. Um, so do you know the answer to that one? Uh, no, no, <laughs> uh, I did not. I did not get that one. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't even know if I, I, I think I think at a certain point I was just like, I'm just reading. I, I don't. I don't have the energy to. to that, or, no, energy is the wrong word. Um, I just want to find out what happens next. Like, like I can't. I can't. I can't wait. Um, I, it, like this whole thing. This whole thing. This whole part of the story is perfect because like Roland got so annoyed with Eddie for not taking riddles seriously, and Eddie's like, "Oh, come on, man! It's it's just riddles, man!" And then this happens. <laughs> right. Right. There's the demon train just wants riddles from them. It's so perfect. I love it. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things it's not just riddles. It's like, it's the kind of riddle that Eddie sucks at uh-huh. and that Roland was good at because like we saw how mad Roland got at Eddie for the, the joke riddle that was illogical and silly and didn't work. What's going to happen <laughs> with what would Blaine's reaction to those be death, immediate death? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So they need Roland here now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. So back in TikTok's lair, the man is demanding Jake tell him about dipolar computers and transitive circuits, which, of course, Jake knows absolutely nothing about. But this is why they want him at someone so young, so alive and all there in his brain that he could maybe understand how to get the inner workings of lead to function. TikTok wants the city. He wants the whole city. And he doesn't want to be like it, you basically get the idea that they've been surviving like at the will of the AI and he wants control of it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Jake is stumbling over his words to get to, to figure out what the hell to answer to about dipolar computers because he knows nothing. And then he does get a mind message from Roland. Uh, apparently, he's close enough to the, a member of the Tet to, to still send some one of those. Distract them, Jake. And if there's a button that opens the door, get close to it. So Jake immediately comes up with a brilliant plan to distract them by telling TikTok that Gasher couldn't remember the password. And the only reason they got in is because Hoots wrote it down for them. It seems that even the TikTok man is aware of IT security best practices and immediately a fight breaks out amongst the greys. Jake tries to get over to the panel that will open the door, but he gets distracted, Matt, when his trusty dog man bumbler thing, Oi, arrives. I love this part, Matt. Jake saw Oi crouching to spring and understood two things. What the bubbler bumbler meant to do and who had put him up to it. Just the fact that he like sees this situation and immediately knows that it's Roland, right? Uh-huh. Like he's just like Roland did this. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, it's it's like like this kind of thing you just know it's going to come back around in some way. Like, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like, like Roland, I mean, buddy, you, you, you did, you did fulfill your promise to come back for me, but in doing so, you just (laughs) demonstrated your willingness to sacrifice 
somebody else. Right. Like, right. like we let's we're, you're not understanding the problem that that I have with your behavior, dude. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I hope I hope that this comes back around and into a into a if not a conversation, then like a, a plot, you know, evolution. Um, yeah, I mean, it could have been something that King just left between Roland and Oi, but he took the time to make sure that Jake is totally aware of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he, he leaps in like Oi leaps onto quick. He pops his eye out, (laughs) um, which is just fucking brutal. Uh Um, but, but Oi is immediately grabbed and about to be twisted in half when Jake thinking quick pulls out TikTok's machine gun and opens fire on him. He hits him once with the machine gun, um, but not enough to kill him. He, He drops Oi. So Oi gets away uh, and then TikTok's coming for Jake. He pulls the revolver out of a hidden pocket in his chair and shoots him right in the fucking forehead. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, it's a really awesome moment. But before he can let Roland in, he's grabbed by Gasher, who still managed to stay alive throughout this whole thing. And he's being ch- uh, stro- choked. He's choked to death, right? Yeah, Gasher's yeah. choking him to death. And then the door opens somehow. somehow. Roland Roland bursts into the inner sanctum. And this is one of those moments where I just you just know that King just like sees this perfect resolution to this conflict he set up at the beginning of this chapter and he just has the perfect way to finish it because Roland walks into the inner sanctum. Gasher looked up. You, he snarled. Me, Roland agreed. He fired once and the left side of Gasher's head disintegrated. The man went flying backward, blood-stained yellow scarf unraveling and landing on top of the TikTok man. Um, this is just fantastic, Matt. Like, like, not, like, my favorite part of it is not Roland saying me. For some reason, my favorite part of it is me, Roland, agreed. The fact that it's agreed there, like, makes the sentence uh, for me. Like, absolutely. Like, just to, to completely communicate the idea that, yep, yep. I told you, I fucking told you, and yep. here I am. Bam, you're dead. Yep you 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 made the you made a bad call there, Gasher. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. should have known better. No, I, I I love it. I love this moment. Um, it's interesting. I I don't know. Like, I'm not sure if I I'm not sure what I actually thought in the moment about the door opening. I think that I either thought, um, Oi had opened it somehow because mm-hmm. he is sort of unaccounted for for a second, or I thought maybe Blaine had opened it because. Uh, if, if these events are happening concurrently, then maybe Blaine is like able to watch this and and do them. But 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 I don't think but I don't think that's the case because this. Yeah, no, I, I don't think that's the case. But mm-hmm. I don't know. That's an interesting mystery. I, I think that I assumed that it was Oi that opened the door. Yeah. Well, I mean, the interesting thing here is what basically what happens here is Roland sends Oi to die. Um, Oi goes to die. <laughs> Oi is going to die. Jake is going to let Roland in and therefore win the day, but it will result in Oi dying. And Jake says no. And he abandons his mission to go press the button on the machine to let Roland in. And he saves Oi instead. And then it's like, well, shit, no Roland. Right. And then Blaine intercedes to let. So like, it's like everything would have happened in a way that is like, you shouldn't have, sacrificed yourself to save away because it would have resulted in your death because yeah. gasher would have strangled him to death roland would not have been able to save him that's what would have happened um right right but if you had let oi die you would have gotten roland in the two of you would have won and you would have lost your bumbler um and and but yeah i mean gasher or um blaine like joining <laughs> joining the the conflict to solve a part of it um is rather significant here yeah yeah it is um mm-hmm. i I just love this this whole scene. I, I thought it, it, I was actually very confused, to be honest, about um, when when uh, uh, Jake shot TikTok in the head and it just like parted his scalp. And I guess I, I so I understand now that it just like glanced off his skull and and just like tore a line through his th- through the flesh of his head. Yeah. yeah. Um. But in the moment, I was just kind of actually, frankly, in the moment, I was like, oh, he's a robot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, no, uh, uh, that's a swing and a miss on that one. Um, yeah, I, I, 
I don't fault you for that. Um, I mean, I, I really like the line. Like I, you can kind of see what King's trying to do, right? He, he has this line there that says Jake didn't know what that meant, but Roland would have, yeah, which yeah. is like, which is like a, a, a more knowledgeable gunslinger or, or just person that knows guns and shooting would have been fully aware that the bullet did not penetrate. Um, but I think King is almost maybe a little too secretive in that. Like he goes, he takes a, a step to explain that something is not right, but not enough. Um, I think, I think it's because he just doesn't want you worried about TikTok man, like getting back up again and fighting them yet. Uh-huh. Um, it makes sense. Yeah. So I think he's like trying to be a little secretive there, but I agree with you. It, it's, it's a little confusing. Um, I, I don't fault you at all for, for getting a little lost in that moment. In any case, Jake's going to learn a valuable lesson about why we always shoot people twice in the head. Yes. Yes. Double tap. <laughs> yep. That's right. Um, so suddenly uh, they've, they've won the day, but air sirens go off across the city. Blaine the insane, the ghost in the machine under the city is awake and angry. And I love, I love King's writing here, Matt. This is a long section, but I'm going to read it all because I think it's really wonderful. Pubes above the streets and greys below them were alike convinced that the end they had always feared was finally upon them. The greys suspected some cataclysmic mechanical breakdown was occurring. The pubes, who had always believed that the ghosts lurking in the machines below the city would someday rise up to take their long-delayed vengeance on the still-living, were probably closer to the actual truth of what was happening. Certainly there had been an intelligence left in the ancient computers below the city, a single living organism who had long ago ceased to exist sanely under conditions that, within its merciless dipolar circuits, could be could only be absolute reality. It had held its increasingly alien logic within its banks of memory for 800 years, and might have held them so for 800 more if not for the arrival of Roland and his friends. Yet this men's non corpus had brooded and grown ever more insane with each passing year even in its increasing periods of sleep it could be said to dream and these dreams grew steadily more abnormal as the world moved on now although the unthinkable machinery which maintained the beams have weakened this insane and inhuman intelligence had awakened in the rooms of ruin and had begun once more although as bodiless as any ghost to stumble through the halls of the dead in other words blaine the mono was preparing to get out of dodge So uh, this is, I think, what something that Stephen King, I think, is really remarkable at doing, like where he does this this long, sweeping, beautiful, poetic prose that I just love to read. And then at the end of it, in case you didn't get it, he just sums it up in just matter of fact, but satisfactory, simple language at the end. Um, And it's part of his style, like like it's almost as if like. I, I don't want to say that. Like I was like, he doesn't, he's trying not to take himself too seriously, but I don't know if that's true. I, I think, I, I, I don't know. I just, I just, I, I agree. I love it. Like, because the truth is, the truth is that you do kind of get lost in this meandering paragraph. Um, like you're, you're, you're swept up in it. You're, you're thinking about a hundred different concepts that he's introduced. He, he just throws in here, the machinery that maintains the beams, the beams are, are mechanical and, and, then, and then just moves on from that. Uh-huh, like, like, uh-huh. cause, cause, cause you're totally assuming the, the machine that, that I guess we kind of knew that the machine, that the, the beams had to be related to machines because Shardik was what, I don't know, whatever. But the, the point is like, he, there's so many ideas in here and then it really does actually just help you to be like, oh, okay. Yeah. He's, mm-hmm. he's getting ready to leave. He's, he's, he's been going crazy um also it verifies here basically uh there had been an intelligence left in the computer a single living organism so Mm -hmm. so the 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 appearance of there being many ghosts was probably just probably just blaine the whole time yeah Uh, the only non-blaine entity we are aware of is little blaine Mm -hmm. that's that's the only one we know about right now um and and we know specifically that little blaine uh does not want big blaine to know he exists yeah and I love that the content like picks up on this pretty slyly like Susanna and Eddie are a little slower on it, but like Roland is like up on the uptake immediately. Like I think someone starts talking about little Blaine when, when the four of them get back together and he's immediately like, yeah, stop it. Stop it. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that is a little, that is a little bit of wrinkle here. We have this, this little Blaine that we know about here. We don't know how that's going to pay off or what it's going to do or what it means, but we know that, that, there's one there's one organism left that big blaine doesn't know about yeah um 
Yeah, I mean, I think you're totally I think you're totally right. Like when you were talking about you're drawing a links between the beams and the portals and and the machinery and all this stuff. I was thinking about this passage here and I couldn't remember whether I had pulled it or not. And I'm glad to see that I did Um, there. It's throwing some curveballs at you, Matt. And of course, to link all this together, once again, we have King repeat the poem the the stumbling through the halls of the dead the, the yeah. rooms of ruin and the halls of the dead is is the thing that that eddie said and now we have it again here this is something that seems to may possibly originate with the people who built this ai built shardik built the portals built these things yeah and maybe it's like their version of the wastelands or something yeah yeah interesting um, I, I like this i like this a lot yeah um yeah, yeah i mean maybe it made me wonder if if maybe like Midworld is the rooms of ruin, you know, like like maybe maybe the wastelands are the halls of the dead. Like mm. I don't know, I, maybe that's too literal, but I, I I do keep trying to figure out where we're going with this this poem. So. Yeah, definitely, definitely, cool. All right, um, so Roland helps Jake out and gets him a glass of water. And there's this really beautiful moment here that I wanted to focus on for a quick second where Roland realizes that he's now doing for Jake what Jake did for him back in book one, The Gunslinger. And I think there's a lot of that in this book, Matt. Moments from The Gunslinger kind of replaying with our characters reversing roles or making different choices or doing something slightly different here. And I think it's it's really important that we that not only does King focus on it, but Roland focuses on it here in this moment where he gives gives Jake a much needed glass of water. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's beautiful. Um, it's we, we're not we're, we're not thrilled with Roland because he still did almost get uh, the Billy Bumber, Bumbler killed. Um, mm-hmm. but, but it, we did get a good outcome and there's sort of this like hope, like is, is Roland going to notice that, <laughs> you know, like th- that his behavior is, is leading to the, to these situations. And I guess you could say, well, it's not that clear cut actually, because you could say the only reason they got, the only reason Jake got caught in the first place leading to this whole situation is that instead of just letting Oi fall, he, he tried to save him. And then the whole quartet was was extremely distracted, allowing Gasher to sneak up on them. Mm-hmm. So you could you could say this whole kind of side quest would have like it was almost like uh uh Oi could have been sacrificed on the bridge and then the quartet would have moved on and been fine. Mm-hmm. Or Oi could have been sacrificed, but, but 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 Jake wouldn't let him. Or Oi could have been sacrificed here by Roland to save Jake, and then the Cotet probably would have moved on. Mm-hmm. But this, but Oi would have died then. And yet again, like now we still have Oi, we, and we have this idea that like there's a dream where Oi is going to be on the train tracks, and right, right, like like the the, the story keeps trying to kill Oi basically yeah. it's like final destination oi yes and jake keeps going to basically repeatedly risking his own life to save oi um and i feel like that's what's been set up like that's that's literally the dream you know so mm-hmm. yeah um yeah, yeah I, I i'm wondering i don't think we're done with that i don't think we're done with the final destination oi uh targeting yeah no i think you're right yeah um Blaine speaks to Roland and Jake, making sure they still have the riddle book and that Roland indeed knows a lot of riddles. He tests him by making him uh, tell him one real quick and satisfied enough that these two can be entertaining. Blaine commands them to follow a little floaty sphere thingy Uh (laughs) and they do. And so they they are uh, as they are uh, following the sphere, they walk through basically the mainframe of blaine i guess um and it's like this this huge server farm looking thing almost it's so it's so 80s early 90s right this concept of like like extremely complicated computers will be like this massive massive machine to do all the processing right um yeah it's it's great it is funny you know it's funny it's not entirely jarring because like this isn't earth earth probably um Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, maybe their computers are different from ours, but sure. Yeah, sure. It, well, they're, they're di- 
They're polar. dipolar. They're dipolar. I mean, see, that was funny to me because I was just like, you don't know what that means. <laughs> That's just a buzzword that you heard. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. I certainly don't know what it means. Right. Two, it has there's two there's two poles. I mean, di- I mean, like, I mean, like a magnet is dipolar. Like that's yeah. the thing is, it's just a sci- it's just a science fiction word that doesn't actually mean anything. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, so as they walk through the mainframe, Jake and Roland see on the monitors that the, the monitors are displaying what's going on around the city. They see the chaos that Blaine has wrought. People are killing each other and themselves by the thousands. Like there's some people just like waiting in line to be killed. Later, Blaine will tell them that he plans to release a poison gas that will wipe out the rest of everyone. Everyone that doesn't kill each other or themselves um, will be wiped out by this gas. River crossing will probably be safe. And I just wanted to point this out here because like we've talked before about how chaos and destruction have followed around Roland and his cotet. Like they just enter a place and they leave it destroyed. This surely it's it's never like it's rarely them doing it, right? Like even until like these people attacked Roland, it was more the man in black's fault than it was Roland's fault. Um, but if they do manage to get out of the city alive, they will be the last things alive in it when they do they will be leaving behind a fully dead city now so it's like this 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 idea this refrain we've seen that they bring change but the change they bring is destructive and and like terrible yeah um i mean true (laughs) uh in this particular case um this is a terrible terrible place they're they're not leaving it better than they found it but I don't know. It's 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 like at least they're not destroying a place that was actually nice. Like all these people sure, are miserable sure. anyway. I guess yeah. that, that makes you feel slightly less bad about it. But yeah, but they're just like children lost in the woods. True. You know? Like true. I, I think I think it is important, and this is why I pulled this part, Matt, because like I think Roland heads us off at the pass on this like we feel bad for these people thing, where he says yeah. because they're frightened and Blaine is feeding their fear, but mostly I think because they've lived too long in the graveyard of their grandfathers and they're tired of it. And before you pity them, remember how happy they would have been to take you along with them into the clearing where the path ends. Uh-huh. So yeah, I mean this is like don't pity them, but maybe not maybe not too much because they totally would have killed all of you yeah. and and worse like who knows what they would have done to jake um if they had gotten to keep him for longer than 10 minutes or so yeah i, I love the language here they've lived too long in the language of their in the in the graveyard of their grandfathers mm-hmm. and they're tired of it like that just being his explanation for what's wrong with these people right it's right very, i mean that yeah that is the wastelands, right? That yeah. is the, the 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 ruined city, the ruins of civilization. Like destroy not only the people that w- were around when those places were destroyed, but all future generations of people that are forced to live there in the graveyard of their grandfathers. Oh, what a line! What a line! Love it. It reminds me of the idea of like Roland is all about honoring, you know, their fathers in a metaphorical mm-hmm. sense, mm-hmm. not forgetting the face of your father. But um, you don't want to live in the graveyard of your fathers. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Like it. So at last, Roland and Jake walk up some stairs uh, through a hidden door and into the cradle of blood. And they are reunited with Eddie and Susanna. This is one of your predictions, Matt, that I think we are both very, very happy to see wrong. The fellowship is united again. Um, they're so wonderfully happy to see each other too. It's a, it's a really delightful scene with, with all of them, the excitement that they feel at being together again. I love it. I know. I was just so sure that they were broken, you know, I, it, it fit the mold of the, of the Lord of the Rings comparison so well. My world is just shattered here. Nothing makes sense anymore. But you're happy, right? I am. Happy. I was very happy. I was, I was almost disbelievingly happy. I was like, no, 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 no. Something's going to happen. Mm-hmm. This is a false this is a false reunion. They're going to get separated again immediately. Yeah. Um, yeah. Didn't, hasn't happened yet. <laughs> yeah. So then Blaine reveals his master plan to them. Um, so now that they're all together, like you have 10 minutes to answer my riddle or 11 minutes and 20 seconds before the canisters rupture and everyone in this place is going to die. Um, he doesn't give a shit about river crossing. He says they'll probably be fine because the prevailing winds will keep the, the poison away from them. So, but it's it's so funny because he he doesn't say they're going to be fine. He says they can count on measuring out their lives in coffee spoons for a few more years, which is just like dismissive and awful. Uh-huh. Um, it's but, it's fascinating that he knows they're there, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. He, he, how, know, how he knows know everything. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so the Katet gets together and begins to think about Blaine's riddle, which they must solve or die. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the delightful evilness of this phrase that he delivers here. The voice paused. One piece of additional input. This gas is not pain, painless. <laughs> um, it just it just delighted me to the dark depths of my soul. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it fits really with Blaine the pain, right? Like yeah. Blaine is a pain and his gas will not be painless. Uh-huh. It, it's really great. Yeah. yeah. It's just like the kind of sardonic sense of humor coming from this evil AI is, is delightful to me. Yeah, yeah. So then at the end of this chapter, we cut back to the Cradle of the Greys. Andrew Quick, the TikTok man is alive and he's having a dream of apple trees and cider in an old park in the middle of Lud, uh, with special focus on the machines crushing the apples to create the cider. I wonder if there's like an original sin metaphor happening here, Matt, like the, like we're, we're in a garden with apples and the crushing of the apple, like this, this f- fruit of knowledge. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's but it's gotta be right. But, yeah, sh- sure. But, but like the thing I was wondering is, I I kind of took this dream literally like this is a memory that he's mm-hmm. but but I was like so the TikTok man who who is a gray like there used to be apple trees in Lud actually and yeah yeah and and like like how long ago was this is he super old is he like way older than I am thinking I think there's some understanding that like the 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 true entire collapse of any kind of order in the city is relatively recent uh, like uh, maybe okay. within his lifestyle I, I think he is older um I, yeah i think i may have just lost track of the timeline again i think mm-hmm. yeah okay yeah then, then i wasn't wrong because i i did think this was a true memory but then i was really mm-hmm. confused about the timeline so. yeah i mean that my reading was he was remembering being a kid as yeah well. yeah um, okay cool so yeah he's alive jake's bullet having only grazed his skull and he's awoken by a man that is not a man what the text says this is the ageless stranger that martin spoke about all the way at the end of the gunslinger we are here at the end of book three matt and we are circling back around to the warning he gave or or the prophecy he gave that said you will meet an ageless stranger um he says the ageless stranger says he's been called merlin but that's not who he really is um he says to call him richard fannin a name that's not exactly right, but quote, close enough for government work, which is a line that is distinctly our world. You know, that is not a line that you would probably hear from Midworld. Right. Right. Um, so Fanon heals quick and gets him to pledge his loyalty to him, which he does. Um, and, and I love this line here. Richard Fanon's lips curled bare and bone key and rose day and night time and tide enough enough. I say they must not draw closer to the tower than they are now. So it appears that we have our antagonist, Matt. Yeah, and uh, this guy seems bad. Um, <laughs> you know, what's funny is at first I was just convinced that this was just the man in black, like mm-hmm. revived somehow. Um, and now I don't know. Um, the fact that he shows up here, like like here specifically, is very strange. Like, wh- what is he doing? Why show up now just to revive TikTok and then mm-hmm. and then send TikTok after him? Like. Like, surely there were other times when he could have ambushed the heroes if he wanted to stop them. So he, he must there must be some reason why he's here and why he didn't sure. come before now um, or, or why he can't do more than he's doing. You know, sure. Um, he, he's definitely weird. Like he, he's weird looking. He's uncanny. Um, he's he's a man, but not a man. It's it's very unsettling. We don't really know what that means exactly. Does that mean he's an android? Does that mean he's a, a monster? Mm-hmm. are those mm-hmm. two the same thing <laughs> um <laughs> right really enticing uh yet again i did not want to stop reading and uh so excited about this book yeah um i think one thing i will say is that fanon mentioned that he was kind of counting on blaine to stop them and he's no longer confident that blaine is going to be doing that because mm-hmm. blaine seems to be much more interested in playing a game with them than just killing them outright um and he's pretty frustrated by that fact so that might be why he's making himself seen now he was like it's gonna be fine it's gonna be fine they'll get to lud blaine will stop them if if the people of lud don't kill them blaine will and then suddenly they're in a spot where blaine is helping them blaine just saved them from tiktok man true and so he's like shit i gotta do something now um fair yeah and then and then that forces you to ask all right all right then then where is he has he been following them this whole time like is he yeah has he literally been 
behind them this whole book <laughs> right well i mean i mean that is the interesting thing here where we have like bear and bone key and rose these are the first two chapters of the book right yeah, yeah and then we go day and night time and tide those are things that we're not quite as familiar with um what is that referring to specifically we don't we don't know um we're we're yeah. following the pattern of chapter titles and then we kind of go off of it a little bit yeah I, that that was I, I didn't I didn't glance to see whether those are the chapter titles because uh, the, the the subsequent ones because I avoid I don't know they're I don't, not uh, chapter okay. six is riddles and and wastelands okay okay so. yeah I don't know I mean I I feel like we're probably going to see those words come up in some other context though okay <laughs> <laughs> there's been a lot of those this week you know the, the I think we're ready for the the, the Matt's musing section and I yeah. think I, I think I did a lot of musing in there and it was, uh, a you lot did. of it was kind of vague. <laughs> Yeah, I think like back when we did We've Got Worm, which is another podcast where I was the Matt and Matt was the me, um, I like put these in a spreadsheet and tracked them. And I don't I don't think we need to be that like literal and explicit with your musings here, Matt. I think I think I've been having fun them just you kind of just sprinkling them throughout the chapters. And then if we find out one is specifically right or specifically wrong, we can circle back to it and pat you on the back or uh, slap you across the face. One of those two. Okay. Um, I don't think we need to like spreadsheet them. And I'm saying this because this is episode 16 and I haven't been doing no, that. No, neither, so. neither have I. Just, just say no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So, so. well, and I don't I, I feel like a lot of my quote like predictions are like I feel like these two things are related like okay that's mm-hmm. not a prediction that's yeah that's wasn't basic. your prediction last week like bad guys are bad or something like that so um, that shouldn't count I I think that was I think that I don't I don't remember that I, look I mean, we do so many podcasts it I, might be a different show I think that was I, a different I, show where I made that prediction yeah I can't even remember oh no anymore. that was the book club that, that yes, was that was right. the way of kings discussion we discussed yeah. way of kings on last Friday's book club if you enjoyed yeah. Brandon Sanderson's novels please check that out yeah doofmedia.com slash book club wait is there a dash between book and club just go to doofmedia.com drop down menu book club you'll see them there it's awesome yep anyway so yeah that's your musings you sprinkled them Maybe I'm just going to take this part out. (laughs) Yeah, you're just going to sprinkle them through. All right. So it's time now to talk about our audience discussion question. Before we get into this, Matt, um, I want to say that someone shared our podcast on uh, a a Dark Tower thread on the books subreddit and it blew up and that's incredible. And I'm so excited. I, I, I put a little addendum after in the middle of last week's podcast to explain why I ignored so many of your discussion question answers. It was not intentional, but like I've been getting a ton of emails from you, you folks that have joined the show recently. Um, and it is amazing. I have not been responding to all of them. I swear I'm going to get around to it. I'm so bad with email and, and I'm screening them and the ones that I are spoiler free. I send on to Matt. So he is seeing your kind words as well. Um, thank you folks so much for sending out those emails. Like it's so great to have so many new people on board. We're having a, a awesome time doing this thing and we're glad you folks are enjoying it as well. Um, it's been really great. So thank you so much for sending in those emails. Um, interacting with you guys is one of the most fun things part about this. It's one of the most fun parts about the show. Uh, I, it, 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 it it makes my heart warm when you guys are so nice and I love hearing your opinions and, and different takes on things that we're talking about. Um, so thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the ones that I have seen, I've, I've really appreciated it. Um, just in case you're wondering if people appreciate your emails when you send mm-hmm. them. Yes, yes, they do. Yeah. Yes, they do. They absolutely do. Even if we don't respond to any of them. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying so much. There's a lot of you guys, which is, makes me so happy, but it makes it hard to respond. I was bad at responding to emails when we were getting like one a week when we're getting like five a day. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's, it's impossible. Yeah. So, well, um, the, the world has moved on. It's hard to manage things. That is true. Time is, is softened. That is true. All right. Anyway, the discussion question for last week was talk about some other stories that employ the riddle device and how and why they used it. I honestly, Matt, when I thought of this discussion question, I was like, this is going to be great. This is a great discussion question. And then I sat down to think about it for a minute and I was like, wait a minute. What not Hobbit book do I know about that uses riddles? <laughs> and I was like, uh oh, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I think I think 
Oedipus Rex does, uh-huh. which of course is our only answer from Sarah Penguin. <laughs> That's the only one I could come up with. Um, I, there, I'm sure there are some others. Like I think, I think um, I, I had it. I lost it. I lost it. Um, I can't think of any. I, I honestly cannot think of any. I mean, so I thought it was a great discussion the, question. Maybe the, it wasn't. The the Riddler. Anything involving the Riddler, right? That that should not. Count. I mean, there's serial killer stories where this where the killer is messing with the detectives and sort of giving them riddles not not in the same exact way Mm -hmm. i guess you're right though there's less than i maybe would have i feel like i had examples in in mind when we gave the question last week i thought i did too and and then i thought about it and i didn't i think ulysses has riddles in it but nobody's actually read ulysses (laughs) so you're right you're right (laughs) Anyway, we only got one answer to the discussion question, but in this case, I'm going to take that as my bad, not y'all's bad. But thank you, Sarah Penguin, for coming up with the only thing I could think of, which was Oedipus. <laughs> so Sarah Penguin says, uh, as my mind drew a blank, same. I'm just going to go with the classic story of Oedipus. An attempt to avoid marrying his own mother, Oedipus runs off to Thebes, where the Sphinx is asking riddles, and whoever defeats the Sphinx gets to marry the queen. After winning at riddles and getting married, Oedipus finds out that he was adopted, and the queen he married was really his mother the whole time. Yup, and he killed his dad, too, and then yep. he blinds himself. So Good the first story. reason so the first reason for why is is to make Oedipus seem clever. If he didn't get to show off his intelligence, then he would be just some moron too stupid to avoid marrying his own mother. <laughs> but as he has shown as smart, it's clearly not his fault and fate forced him into it. Ancient Greeks were big on the whole three fates dictate all and everyone dies at some point as a pl- as a plot of tragedies. That's very true. Ka. A more important question. Yeah, there you go. Ka. Ka. The more important question is why it is a sphinx asking and why does the cat girl kill herself after losing at riddles? The first part of the answer is that ancient Greek stories normally have a monster for the hero to to defeat or overcome and she fits the bill. But that could be any monster. A possible answer is liminality or thresholds. A sphinx is a liminal being as it is in between human and animal. It thinks and riddles like a human and kills then eats like a lion. In ancient Egypt, the sphinx were put the sphinxes were put outside of holy sites or burial sites so that they were guarding the threshold. And it's also possible that they were seen as a guardian of the threshold between life and a death. Now in the story, she is stopping anyone from entering or leaving Thebes. So she is acting also acting as a liminal guardian in the story. Um, and, and Sarah Penguin goes on to talk about how Oedipus could also be a liminal figure. I think that's really cool. I love it. Um, and that's a great answer. So not only did Sarah Penguin think about the only answer that I could think about, but she went somewhere with it that I wasn't even considering. So I, uh-huh. I, I love that so much. So thank you, Sarah Penguin, for for coming up with an answer to my my bad. It was a bad question. I thought it was a good question. It turns out it wasn't. It seemed good to me at the time, too. I don't know what yeah. happened. <laughs> <laughs> you actually had to think about it. That's what happened. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like I like liminal. I like I like the concept. The, the, the best English class I ever took in college was was a was very much about or involve this concept of, of the liminal, liminal spaces and spaces mm-hmm. where things can be, can be, um, ambiguous between two different domains. It's, it's yeah. a fun, it's a fun thing to play with. I mean, how many liminal spaces are there in, in this series, right? There seems there's a lot of them. Yeah. I mean, we've got doorways, we've got yeah. moving between worlds, we've got dreams. Mm-hmm. These are all liminal. Yeah. 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 Sure. All right. This week's discussion question, which I hope is a little bit better, um, is, why did Roland save Jake this time? And don't just say because he promised because yes, but why? Yes. <laughs> yes. What, what is, what is different about Roland? What is different about Jake? What is different about the choices that made Roland choose something different this time? So that's the question. Come up with some good answers. I want to hear them. I'm sure they're going to be great. The cool. better than riddles. <laughs> All right, that is it for us here on Kingslingers this week. Next week, we will be finishing the book, talking all about Chapter 6, Riddle and Wasteland. It's going to be a short chapter. I think it's only 48 or 49 pages, so uh, maybe it'll be a shorter episode. Probably not, because we just tend to fill the time, no matter how long the pages are. It's just what we do. It's true. But it also makes me sad, because that means I only get to read 60 pages or whatever, and then I'm, then I'm done. Yeah, but you're done. Then you finish the book and you get to put aside and be like three books down. Yeah. Four to go. I suppose so. I suppose so. Technically, technically. Technically. technically All right. Five to go. But, you know. Five. To, yeah. Okay. Well, 
uh, yeah, remember you can reach out to us uh, at uh, kingslingerspod at gmail.com or on Twitter at Doof Media. You can also discuss uh, these episodes on uh, reddit.com slash r slash Doof Media. There, there will always be um, a, a Reddit thread there for each episode. Um, yep. So that, you know, if, if that's your preferred kind of user experience, that might be the place where you want to go and send your discussion question answer. Um, or just talk or, about some other stuff. We get a lot of other random comments there as well. Yep. And some people start some good discussion. So, yep. If you are not already subscribed to Kingslingers, we strongly, strongly recommend you do so, um, or else we're going to release a painful gas. <laughs> kills everyone um you can find us on itunes stitcher spotify youtube google play and pretty much anywhere else in the world you can listen to podcasts yeah and if you like any of our shows and you want to support us consider donating to our patreon account at patreon.com slash doof media you uh, if you donate to us at the ten dollar level um you can get access to monthly exclusive bonus content which in the future will include some exclusive audio content that we're preparing yeah we're gonna try to do like one kind of bonus audio bit a month and it'll be that level that'll that'll be one of the rewards for supporting us at that level there's also like a backlog of ten dollar rewards that that you would get access to i believe yes absolutely yeah yeah so yeah um on um on one of our old podcasts, every uh, specifically the ward podcast every week we would we, we would read the names of those new patrons that have decided to support us um, or or up their their donation level that week. Uh, That show is about to come to an end. Mm -hmm. Um, We're one or two weeks away from ending it. And so we're going to switch that over to here. Um, And so with that in mind, this week we have special thanks to the following new patrons. Uh, At the Bidoof level, we have Bread Boy. We have new Doof Dancers, Alexa B, Dennis D., uh, Crystal L upgrading and Diora M. We have new Doof Troop member ENP upgrading to that level, and we have new Supreme Leader Doof Thomas A also upgrading. Um, welcome everyone. Those of you from uh, from this show, from other shows, it's great to have you. We hope to see you in the Discord and the subreddit, and we we just can't wait to get to know you guys. Yeah, I mean, I, I seriously. Y'all are wonderful and I thank you. And if you are new to Patreon, I think a lot of our listeners might be new to Patreon's whole thing. Um, The Discord is a really great place to talk about not just this show, but Stephen King in general. We have a whole Dark Tower spoilers channel that Matt is not allowed to go into where we can just talk all about. I just smacked my mic because I'm so excited. We just talk all about the Dark Tower and about Stephen King in general. Um, and that's a great place to chat in a different kind of way. It's, it's, it's more immediate. It's a chat, not so much a forum or a posting or a comment or anything like that. So if, if you're one of our new patrons and you don't know how Patreon works, you can link a Patreon account with a Discord account, and that gets you access the second you pledge or the second you link your accounts. It'll automatically drop you in the Doof Media Discord, where not only talking about Stephen King, talking about movies, talking about TV shows, talking about books, talking about video games, um, a bunch of our other shows we're doing, like our friends have all these other shows going on right now. So um, it's a great place to chat and hang out. And you get that at any donation level. That's that's just even a, a buck a month gets you access to that. And I think it's great. I spend too much time there, especially now that I don't go outside and see humans. Um, I hang out there a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, I really am glad that I have that now. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But of course, if you cannot afford to donate right now, that is absolutely OK. You can instead helping help us out by sharing this podcast. I'm sorry, I don't have the name of the person who shared the on the Stephen King thread on r slash books. But thank you and thank everybody else who has shared this podcast with all your Stephen King loving friends and family and anyone. Um, you can also help us out by leaving us a rating and a review. This week's spotlight review comes from Aqua Buddha, who gives us five stars and says, looking forward to the journey. Ever since finding out about Doof Media from their We've Got Worm podcast, I've always thoroughly enjoyed their analysis and discussions. And because of that, I'm super excited to see them tackling a huge story that I somehow never got around to reading. So just like Matt, this will be my first time going through the story, and the first episode has already shown me there's plenty of things that I missed on my read of the first chapter. I highly recommend the show to anyone who enjoys Stephen King, literary analysis, or just plain talking about complicated and interesting stories. Whether you've read The Dark Tower before or just diving into it for the first time, I'm sure you'll find something 
something of interest in this podcast. Thank you so much, Buddha. And thank you everyone else who has taken the time to drop those ratings and review it. I think we're almost up to like over a hundred uh, ratings on Apple podcasts, which is incredible. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> wow, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, folks, I'm done talking now. Matt's done talking. We're, we're both done. We will see you here next week as we complete chapter six riddle and wastelands and complete the book the wastelands long days and pleasant nights and may you have twice the number